Gilligan with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Um, today's date is May 24th, 2016. I'm in Ardmore, Oklahoma. Um, today I'll be talking with uh, Wesley Hull, or uh, retired Rear Admiral Wesley Hull, um, who is the director of the, um, oh, I'm going to get the whole Southwest... Museum Great, of the Southwest. Greater Southwest. Greater Southwest. Historical Museum. Historical Museum. I knew all of those words were in there. I <laughs> yeah. have like rearranged them 12 different times in my head. Um, and with this interview is a part of the O State Stories Oral History Project with the subset of Cowboy in Every County as a part of the 125th anniversary of the founding of OSU. Um, all right, now all the formal stuff is over with. So, uh, Tell me a little bit about, like, give me a little bit of background information. Where are you from? Who are your parents? What did they do? Do you have siblings? All that good stuff. Well, I was born in Oswald, Oklahoma. Uh, they don't exist any longer. Uh, started grade school at, at Oswald. And uh, then back in 1945, uh, moved over to Johnson County near, near Wapanaka for a few years so my dad could put in the first black, uh, black land alfalfa farm there. And I started my freshman year of high school at, uh, at Wapanaka. I completed my grade school at Plainview Public School, not the one near Ardmore, but the one in Johnson County. It was a, a relatively small school. And uh, then in uh, 1950, we moved back to Jimtown, Oklahoma. And my dad opened up a country store. And of course, growing up on a farm, Farm boys do a little bit of everything, and a uh, little bit of hunting back and forth, uh, squirrels and rabbit, because if you don't get one of those, you may not have meat on the table for supper. And uh, as a farm boy, you do a little bit of everything, where it's plowing, cultivating, hoeing, baling hay, picking cotton, shaking peanuts, or slopping the hogs. But uh, that's part of the life of growing up in the country. I graduated high school at Leon, a very large graduating class. There were nine of us. And uh, for our field trip, I recall uh, we got two cars and we took the entire class and we spent a week in New Orleans for our field trip. With for, like school sanctioned? It was school, school <laughs> sanctioned. And uh, one thing I remember about it, uh, since there were two cars of us, we had some way, needed some way to try to recognize the cars we get in traffic. And there was more traffic down around New Orleans than we'd ever run across in Love County. But uh, that was in 1954, and there happened to be an individual from Medill running for governor. Gary for governor, Raymond Gary. So we took his political signs, instead of sticking them on the bumper, we put them on the back of the cars so we could see them at a distance so we could keep track of each other. <laughs> and uh, graduating from Leon, I had no idea what I wanted to do. However, I knew th one thing I did not want to do. I didn't want to stay on the farm and bale hay, pick cotton, and what have you. So I uh, run across a friend of mine who graduated from Meadowbrook, and uh, his sister could drive a little bit better than we could, so she took us over to MIT with our high school transcripts to enroll in MIT. And uh, as I'm standing in line, of course, it's the sophomores that usually handles all the paperwork. There's probably a teacher around somewhere but and some administrative people. But uh, finally, I get up to the table, and the young man looked at me, and he says, what are you going to enroll in? I says, college. And he says, I know that, but what are you going to enroll in? I thought, my God, I'm just come from Leon. I know more than that. I want to enroll in. I said, I want to enroll in college. I guess he finally realized that I might be a country boy. He says, yes, I realize you want to enroll in college, but what field? I says, no, that's the reason I'm here, to get out of those fields. And uh, so he said, well, you've got to enroll in something. What about agriculture? I says, no, I don't want agriculture. He said, what about arts and science? Well, coming from Leon and Jimtown, I didn't think I wanted that because I wasn't an artist and I didn't know much about science. So I said, no, I don't want that. He mentioned two or three other things, and then finally he mentioned engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. And I probably hadn't heard some of those, and then he mentioned civil engineering. And I asked questions, well, what all do they do? And he explained what civil engineers do, and that appealed to me. I said, that's for me. 
I'm going to enroll in civil engineering. Hand him a transcript. He looked at it. He went over it. He said, uh, you can enroll in civil engineering. I said, you just told me I could. He said, you don't have any, your math requirements. You don't have trigonometry and geometry. And I'm not sure I'd heard those words before. And he says, you can't enroll in engineering. You've got, that's one of the requirements. I said, well, what can I do? He said, uh, we can enroll you in high school courses. I said, do I have to pay for it? He says, sure. I says, daddy won't be happy. I says, what's the other option? He says, well, have you had any of that in school? I said, oh, yes. Being country boy, you've done everything. He says, if you can pass an exam, you can enroll in engineering and you won't have to take high school courses. I have one major regret in that regard. I didn't get his name. I'd like to find him. I'd like to shake his hand, hug his neck, and thank him for passing those exams. Oh, what? And I enrolled in civil engineering. Basically, it was basically the basic courses for engineering because he passed the exams and they said I had all the math I needed to do that. He passed the exams for you? Um, we collectively oh. did it. <laughs> he, he was my tutor. He was very hands-on, it sounds he was, like. He first. was very hands-on. and <laughs> He felt sorry for that old country boy. And so um, I spent two years at MIT. That's Murray and Tishomingo. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> and... Uh, the, uh, but I had already picked out where I probably wanted to go, and that was on to Stillwater. And I happened to ask one of the instructors, I said, since I've got to pay for all these courses I'm taking, if I go to Stillwater, are they going to accept everything I'm taking? And so the instructor, professor said, we will work it where they will. And so I did not lose an hour from Tishomingo to go into Stillwater. And after my two years at Murray, I went on to Stillwater and ran a little garage apartment, 407 Maple Avenue. And uh, I was able to get through Murray by being a farm kid. I always raised hogs. And I was still raising hogs, and my dad was taking care of them for me. But I had a, an agreement. My dad had a country store. As they'd call it back then, we sold sliced bread. And uh, Culvert's Dairy delivered milk down there for those that didn't have a milk cow any longer. So I made a deal with all the bakery people. I said, I know you come around and you pick up stale bread from the different stores. I'll buy it from you. I told the milk guy, Calvert's Milk, I said, I will buy all of your milk that you pick up that you can no longer sell. And they said, what are you going to do with it? I said, I'm going to feed my hogs. So I took the bread, and if I had to pay for them, it was very minimal. I think they felt sorry for me, and they had a way of getting rid of it, and they got agreement from everywhere. And I'd take my bread and put it in five-gallon buckets, pour my milk over it, and probably water it down a little bit, set it in the sunshine. And it didn't take long. Those hogs loved it. Uh, at least they got to the weight that uh, you needed to market them. And uh, I made a deal with my dad since he sold feed there. My dad told me I could have every sack that was broken, every sack of feed that was broken. Uh, things would get in the feed room out there and break those sacks from time to time. But at least my hogs got fat. <laughs> and Daddy knew what I was doing because he figured hey, he wants to go to college, and he's going to support me one way or the other. So he was okay with... So he with, was okay with those sacks getting broken. Those sacks getting being broken, broken, coincidentally, after you had yeah. been in there. And uh, I got on up Stillwater. That was considerably larger than Tishomingo. Mm -hmm. And the buildings were considerably larger. I made a lot of friends, student union. It don't take you long. Being country boy, you got to know everybody. A lot of wonderful people in engineering and great professors that were there to help you. And the, I remember our strength of materials uh, professor. He said, I want to give you kids some good advice. He says, the best way to succeed in this world is marry the boss's daughter. 
And that kind of stuck with me all those years. I never did find a good boss, though. But uh, graduated in 1958. And uh, while I was in Tishomingo, I worked for the school. I worked in the uh, machine shop, getting all of the materials ready for the classes and worked with Mr. Courtney at, at Tishomingo. And I worked, worked over in the woodworking shop, basically cleaning it, sweeping it out so I could, they would keep that money for my tuition and room and board. And uh, so I continued to work some at, uh, at Stillwater in the materials te testing lab because Stillwater would test the concrete cylinders and they would be delivered. I, who far, I don't know, but it would be our job to put those concrete cylinders testing the strength of the concrete. We'd put it in big presses and see what where they would fail. And we had document all of that. And uh, so I don't remember how much I got. It wasn't all that much, but it, every penny helped out on that. And uh, of course, you've got all that coursework back and forth. And I remember one course was seven hours. Thin shell structures was a seven hour course. I believe we had two labs and we met every day. That was in one semester, it was a seven hour course. A seven, seven hour course in one semester. And of course that summer between my junior and senior year, the requirement was we had to have seven hours of surveying. And that's when the uh, Camp Webster Lance Benham, named after the engineering uh, individual, the engineer in Oklahoma City, he supported the, uh, the university in establishing Camp Webster Lance Benham out near Buena Vista, Colorado. And uh, we spent the summer out there doing nothing but surveying. But we took seven hours on that. And uh, one of the professors I remember that was out there was uh, Professor R.P. Witt. Mm -hmm. He was one of the uh, surveying instructors. Uh, they had acquired the big green army tents, I guess from surplus from the army. Uh, that's what we lived in, uh, in the mountains in, in Colorado. And when we'd have a break, we'd always go trout fishing and we'd have trout for dinner. And then uh, when you're getting close to that last semester, you're gonna, got high hopes, you're gonna get that sheepskin. So if anybody comes to campus interviewing that's any related field whatsoever, you try to get on that list and talk to them because you're looking for a job. You're gonna be a bright kid, you're coming from OSU, that big university, you've got that sheepskin, you're ready to go conquer the world. And the, the, U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey came through because at that time they were recruiting only civil engineers. They would recruit an agricultural engineer if they had uh, six hours of physics and differential and integral calculus. But it was basically civil engineers that were recruiting and naturally I interviewed. There was another firm, I interviewed with anybody I could, but there was another firm, Texas Employers Insurance Corporation. Uh, they came through and interviewed, and apparently they liked my interview, and they called me down to Dallas for my second interview, and then later they called me back for my third interview. And after that third interview, they said, you've got the job. Man, I was a happy kid. They said, as soon as you get your draft obligation out of the way. I was fortunate, my grades were good enough, that I never had to have a deferment from the draft. Those students that got a deferment, they were gonna be drafted right away. But uh, since I didn't have to have a deferment, I was gonna be allowed to work before the draft board sent me the congratulation letter. So since Texas Employers Insurance told me that I had the job as soon as I get my draft obligation out of the way, I had talked to the Coast and Genetic Survey, the Commission Corps. And uh, so I got on the pay telephone in the lobby and called their offices in Fort Worth. And I said, Can, today is a great day for you. You have the opportunity to bring me into the commission corps. And, they, and I said, uh, but I've got to know within a week. They said, we can't get the paperwork through in a week. I said, if you don't notify me in a week, bye. I will go to California because I'd been offered by the California Highway 
I'd been offered $425 to come to California and go to work for the state highways. So the Coast and Genetic Survey says, we can't get you an answer that fast. I said, okay, that's your problem. I drove back to Stillwater. A couple of days later, I had a telegram delivered, which I still have. Congratulations. You've been accepted into the Commission Corps of the Coastal Genetic Survey. Letter follows. Wow. <laughs> they I got it together <laughs> quick then. I, get they, I got it rather quick. Best I recall, I graduated on the 25th of May. And the, I went down and uh, to be sworn in down to Fort Worth and I put on my response to them that I'd be at their offices on June the 2nd to be sworn in. They got back with me and said it'd be more convenient if you were down here on June the 1st instead of June the 2nd to be sworn in. I responded to them, June the 1st is on a Sunday, but I will be at your offices at eight o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning, and you better be there. They got back to me and says, we apologize, we hadn't looked at the calendar. Monday, June the 2nd is adequate. So I was sworn in and they said, here's your orders. Report to the ship in San Francisco. Let me ask you something really quickly, because I think this is interesting. Um, because you were ready to push back. I mean, like, you were young. You were just out of college, and you were ready to push back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How? That seems to me that that's, that's a very adult situation. So I'm just curious, like, was that a comfortable situation for you? Is that just how you were at that point? Is... Well, I guess it's because my mom and dad... My dad told me, you're going to do a job. You're going to do it. And I had looked up. I knew the 2nd of June was on a Monday. I knew the 1st of June was on a Sunday. And what little I knew about the federal government, I knew they didn't work on Sundays. And so I thought, hey, you're going to get me. I'm going to straighten you out. <laughs> but that, that's the thing, though. Like You even took the initiative to call them and say... Um, so you should hire me. Like, you have this very tiny window of opportunity to hire me, so do it or don't do it, which is also really... I, I had a feeling when I interviewed the gentleman's name, I still remember his name, Captain Rusty Russell. That's a four-striper. He's the same as a full colonel in the Army or Marine Corps, something of that nature. But he interviewed me, and I... Wasn't accustomed to talking to a lot of people. You talk to anybody out in the fields. I mean, you're talking all the time over that. But uh, I had a feeling he thought I could do good in the Corps. And uh, so I felt pretty good that I could get that job. And hey, I'm out of college. One thing that was driving me, I went to Jack Graham Ford in Marietta before I graduated. And sitting on his showroom floor, he had a black and white Ford Crown Victoria Interceptor Special Police Engine, a two-door hardtop. And I thought, man, I need that car. I've been driving a Ford pickup, an old rundown Plymouth. So it was $2,500. I didn't have $25, much less $2,500. But I told him, I says, hey, give me credit. I've got my sheep, I'm gonna get that sheepskin, I'm gonna get me a good job and I'll pay you for it. And he says, well, I don't give credit to people like you, but he says, I tell you what, you go up and see Mr. Gaylor. And get Mr. Gaylor to loan you the money. He says, what do you got to put up as collateral? I said, what's that? So I go up and see Mr. Gaylor. Mr. Gaylor was president of First National Bank Marietta. I go and see Mr. Gaylor. Told him, hey, I'm gonna do great things. I've got my sheepskin from OSU. And I'm gonna be getting a good job. But that good job, I need a new car. And uh, he said, well, you got any collateral? 
I said, is that something you take if I don't pay? He said, yes. I said, I ain't got none of that. He said, do you think your dad will sign for you? I said, I'm probably talking in notion. He said, okay, I'll tell you what to do. You go back to Jack's and you pick out the car, Jack Graham, the Ford dealer. He says, you pick out the car you want, regardless of the price. You come back here and after you get your car, call your dad to come over or bring him back tomorrow the next day and have him sign with you. I did. And so now I've got that car and I'm paying $215.59 a month. And I ain't got no job except the last hogs I'd sold. And the last hogs I sold was a, a double deck, double decker semi. I filled that with hogs to get the rest of the way through Stillwater. So how much did you make with that? Do you remember? I don't remember what it was, but uh, it was enough to get me through. Mm -hmm. And so I had that car, I had to make payments. I had to have a job. Otherwise, Mr. Gaylor is going to wind up my car. And so I had said deadline. You're going to put me to work by a certain date. And so I get some money coming in. And the California would put me to work, 425 a month. So that's the reason I was forceful. Hey, make up your mind. I've got to do something so Mr. Gaylor don't get my car. And so that telegram got me there. Yeah. And I contacted Texas Employers Insurance and probably wrote them a pretty nice letter thanking them and uh, that uh, I was getting my draft obligation out of the way. I would be going in as a, an ensign. I'd receive a commission as an ensign in the Coast and Genetic Survey. They wrote me a nice letter back. Probably somewhere in my files at home, I've still got it. Thank you so very much. Uh, stay in contact with us when you get your draft obligation out of the way. You've got the job. I retired 1st December 1990. I started to contact them and say, hey, I've got my draft obligation. When do I start work? But I figured they still might offer me that $400 a month. <laughs> so Fort Worth told me to go to San Francisco to join a ship. And, uh, of course, it's too late in the day for me to head out. I wasn't quite sure where I was going, so I went back home at Jimtown. Early the next morning, I went over and seen Mr. Gaylor and drew out every bit of the money I had in my bank account. I filled up my car. The tank was full from my dad's gas pump at the Jimtown store. And I left with a full tank of gas, and all the money I had in the world was $50 and I headed to San Francisco. And with the hamburgers I ate or the bologna I ate and my canvas water cooler hanging on my front bumper to keep the water cool going across the desert, I spent $37 getting to California with gas and what little food I ate. And so, uh, I finally found the ship and reported aboard the ship. And uh, they said, uh, well, we, we got to take you out to the naval base and buy your uniforms. You got to go buy your uniforms. I said, what do you mean buy uniforms? I ain't on the money. So I probably arranged a loan. The accounting officer probably owned me some money. And somebody took me out to buy the proper uniforms. And about the time of that, well, I had to leave my car. They let me leave my car on the dock. I took seven of my $13 I had left, and I bought a car cover. I parked my Ford on the dock, put that $7 car cover on it, and we sailed. How we long went, have you had your car by this point? I'm just curious. Oh, I went in the, uh, I got my commission on the 2nd of June, and I think I got my car in April. So I had it for two, two or three weeks at, at Stillwater. And somewhere in the Pacific, I'd never seen so much water in all my life. We went on that Golden Gate Bridge, and I thought, good Lord, that's a big bridge. Nothing like that ever crossed Red River. And the only other boat I'd been on basically was a, a paddle wheeler out of New Orleans when we took our senior trip. We rode down the Mississippi on a paddle wheeler. I thought that was a lot of water. 
And we sailed. We was out two or three months. We came back in. Man, I made it great. The ocean was choppy. Everything was wonderful. We come back in to refuel, reprovision, or do whatever we did. We sailed again. We went out, cleared the Golden Gate Bridge. The ocean was glassy smooth. I got seasick because it was so smooth. We headed out, and I guess the next port of call was Pearl Harbor. We were there a few days, and then we went on out to the Central Pacific, Kwajalein and Weetok area. Somewhere in the Pacific, one year later, laying on my bunk in a is either a four or six bunk room. I counted my money. I had fifty dollars. My gas tank was empty. My car was sitting on the dock in San Francisco. I thought I'm getting ahead in this world. Well, I thought I was commissioned as an ensign, but then Washington come back through and says Congress, the Senate didn't get around confirming your commission as ensign. So therefore, we have brought you on as a deck officer. $359 a month. Later, the Senate confirmed me. They notified me. Now you are confirmed by the Senate. You are now a commissioned officer as an ensign. And your salary is $222.30 a month. I thought, but wait a minute. You just gave me a promotion. I was making $359, but now you give me $222. That don't sound like a promotion. But that's what it was. An instant salary hadn't been raised in seven years, $222.30 a month. So an elevated position made less than in just an entry position? Yes. Didn't seem quite right to me, but that's the way it went, being a deck officer. And uh, we worked the Central Pacific. I found that job to be interesting because this was back when the spacecraft was starting. Used to, this capsules would splash down in the Pacific somewhere. They'd have difficulty finding some of them. But being surveyors, we said, hey, if we had the, the Pacific instrument with hydrophones and we led a cable out to some receiving station, something splashes down around those hydrophones, we'll triangulate, you'll have a position, and you'll know where to go retrieve the capsule. That's exactly what happened. I worked Central Pacific, Kwajalein, Anawetok, Midway, Johnson, Wake, Pearl Hermes Reef, in and out of Pearl Harbor quite frequently. And finally got off of that ship assignment and went to working in photogrammetry, shoreline mapping, getting ready to produce nautical charts. So how did you know about all that equipment? Is that something that you had experience with or other people on the ship had experience with? The surveying equipment, OSU taught me how to use that. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I'll tell you exactly how I got assigned one job. It was either, it was either Johnson or Wake Island. We had to put a survey party ashore. And the operations officer called the young officers together who's got experience in running a a T2, a veil theodolite. And nobody held up their hand. And one of them, I think he might have been in Mississippi, said, Wes Hull knows how because I saw a picture of him looking through a T2 theodolite from Camp Webster Lance Benham. He saw a picture of you that you had with you, or he saw a picture of Apparently you at the camp? Apparently I had camp. it with me. Okay, yeah. Well, I had it with me, I have no idea. But that's that in between that summer program. That summer program, of course, we, we had uh, good survey equipment. But somebody had taken my picture, and it was in something. I don't know what. Mm -hmm. But he spoke up, and they says, oh, Hull, you know how to run a T2. Did you know you knew how to run, run a T2? Well, Professor R.P. Witt taught me. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, for the other equipment, mm -hmm. we had very experienced, very capable officers because they're all college degrees, they're engineers, on the job training. And the, it's just the way it worked. If something needed to be done, they would train you, they would show you. And one of the first things I learned when you do any survey, when you do any work, you do your computations, but then someone else with the experience 
checks all your computations, checks it and initials. So everything is checked for accuracy. And having a group of engineers dedicated, such as the Coast Survey has had for their entirety, that's what it made it wonderful. If you were willing to learn, there was somebody there willing to show you and work with you. Because they look at it very small, a very small cadre of individuals. Today, it's changed from the Coast and Genetic Survey to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Commission Corps. But we've only got uh, a little over 350 commission officers to operate a fleet of ship and a fleet of aircraft. And so you train later in my career. Uh, I let it be known that we should have a formal training program to bring these kids out of school. We recruit from the universities. We should have a formal training program. I knew the military etiquette because of Air Force ROTC at Murray. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that. The I took two years of ROTC at Murray. Uh, to tell you how some people impress you, Captain Hermerstoffer, Captain Gomez, and Sergeant Holman were the three individuals at Murray, was our instructors. Now we were under OSU, and the OSU ROTC people would come to Murray and inspect us at least once a year. And they would be in the stands at the football stadium. We would all fall in, you're assigned to squadrons and what have you. We would all fall in and we would march and we'd be evaluated by our higher ups from Stillwater to evaluate us. Captain Gomez was a pilot and he would check out the T-33s from Perrin Air Force Base, Sherman area, and he would come and do barrel rolls over the campus. Like how? Like just, just He'd come in with that T-33 quite low and he'd just do a barrel roll, vroom, just shaking, we'd know who was up there. But a lot of people may not remember their ROTC instructors. I remember those individuals. Mm -hmm. They worked with you. They were there for one reason. That was to train you. And uh, so uh, I enjoyed ROTC. If there was a parade, we marched. We represented the school. We represented the Reserve Officer Training Corps of the Air Force. And they learned your discipline. And I recall... One time, Captain Gomez, he lined us out and gave us our instructions before our inspection from Stillwater. He says, if the colonel asks you, how do you like ROTC? He says, don't have a problem of telling it. Colonel, I don't like it worth a damn, sir. He says, if you don't close off with sir, you're going to deal with me. He says, you're all going to be in spitting polish in your uniforms. I don't want anybody wearing yellow cowboy boots. That's the wrong thing to say. It wasn't me. But we were marching in formation to be inspected. And guess what? We had one young man in uniform with a pair of yellow cowboy boots. That's just the way we operated with. We worked with them. We respected our instructors, our professors. I think in general, they respected us. What happened to the yellow cowboy boots? Did he get called out? He got called out after the inspection. And he got probably a few demerits. And he didn't get to do some things the rest of us got to do, but Captain Gomez got him. Mm -hmm. And uh, But uh, they taught you all about the military history. I thought it was a very good program, and we still should have it kind of required on all of it. Mm -hmm. It's a good tool for young people to go through. They teach you the discipline, and that's important. Is that something you felt like you needed when you started college? Well, I didn't know anything about it. I was disciplined because my daddy had a razor strap. And if you got a whipping at school, you got a big one when you got home. That's just the way I was raised. Mm -hmm. There wasn't no child abuse or anything of that nature. And uh, somebody would tell him if, if you got a whipping at school because there was a bigger one at home. And uh, 
my daddy always said, Vinoy, if you're going to do a half job, don't start it. And that's, that's something you remember. Yeah. And that's just the way it has gone. Uh, after, after we completed our project on the Columbia River, we was working with the Army Corps of Engineers out of Walla Walla, Washington. They were going to build a John Day Dam flood. Mm -hmm. So we went in and mapped everything before they flooded it. It's easier to map on dry land than it is on water. So you all went in and did pre-survey survey we, work of the land that they we, were going to We flood. did all the survey work of the land. So when they flooded it, you already, you already knew how deep the water was because we had all the topographic information. And we work with the Corps extensively. And from... We finished that job and they decided uh, they needed me in Galveston, Texas. So me and my wife, we traveled to Galveston, Texas, got set up and reported to the unit because the unit was going to be moving. I was going to stay behind in Galveston, Texas to do five foot contours of all of Galveston, including the oil refinery and everything there for mapping. And I reported to my unit and I walked in and said, yeah, I'm, I might have been JG that time, junior grade, I'm so-and-so Wes Hull. They says, we know, we knew you was coming, we got a copy of your orders. Very friendly people. Turned to the second man in charge. He said, break out a T2 and P4. Get out there and give me a sunshot, computed. I mean, I just reported it. He wanted to know my capabilities. Mm -hmm. And that P4 is a prism you put on the put on the end of it. And so I took a sunshot, computed, it was checked, it was correct. Most wonderful people you ever heard across in your life. Great people. But he wanted to know my capabilities. He wanted to know what I could do. And if you can just walk in and take a sunshot and compute it, first of all, you've just reported, you don't know these people, you're nervous and everything else. But I passed the test. Wonderful people. And uh, I, I wonder, I just have a question too, because it, when you talk about your time at OSU, you, you had this required summer survey course. Did you think you were going to be using that after graduation? A civil engineer, you use it every day. So it was, you, you were assumed that, that all of that was going to come in handy like that? Well, that was required civil engineering. That was required courses. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I mean, I'm, I went to the university and they require this. I assume I'm going to be using it because they told me I was going to be an engineer. I mean, I had no, I had no facts to base it on. They said it's required. And they told me calculus was required. I passed calculus. Did you use calculus? Roundabout ways have, but you know, calculus is kind of different. Uh, I'm sure it taught you a lot of basics to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Trig, geometry, algebra, you use that all the time. But to just get in on calculus, it sets the basis basis for a lot of stuff. But since survey work was re uh, those survey courses were required, I didn't question whether I'm going to use it or not. I'm going to be a civil engineer. I assume that's part of the job, and yes, civil engineers use that. Yeah. And so. Well, but you to an extreme measure, it seems like. I mean, like, you know, you were doing stuff in the water. I mean, like, wasn't just on land, right? So. Yeah. Was it easy for you to transfer those skills that you learned while you were at OSU? Because you went immediately and got on a boat. <laughs> no, that's right. Was it easy for you to transfer those skills? Yeah, I could survey the land. Um, they taught me at Murray. I'd take survey courses at Murray. Now, I'd never heard in surveying break the chain. But if you're surveying down the slope... You've got to measure distances horizontal. And if you use a 100-foot tape and you can only go 37 feet, at 37 feet, that's all you can... You break your chain on 37 feet and you've got a new point to start with. You don't physically break the chain. However, yeah, you're dealing with kids. The first course we had in surveying, he told us to survey this, you're going to have to break the chain five times. My survey crew, we went out there, we broke this, we measured that distance. 
Here's one survey crew come in, and guess what they got? They got their tape broken five times. They had no effort to break it, but they broke it. Kids. <laughs> Found that interesting. So you got to be careful what you tell people. Go break. You got to break the chain to measure that distance. Well, you can't make assumptions that people understand. And they said the, break the chain. So yeah. And, <laughs> what uh, the lingo is. Oh, so, they, you could transfer it pretty well. I'd never heard the term fathometer, the thing you measure water depth with. I'd never heard the term standard seawater. I didn't know what that was. Salinity. Yeah, the Red River was salty. That's only salinity I knew. But you take all of that into account when you're correct when you're when you're measuring depths in the ocean because you've got different salinities and that affects your stat the sound of through seawater. The sound through seawater, you send it out and you receive it. And if you send it out on a calibrated system, then you correct it. That's on standard seawater, but then you make your corrections based on your temperature and salinity versus depth. Mm -hmm. And so that transpired relatively easy. Uh, I had done some star shots, sun shots in the past, and when you're on a ship, well, uh, three o'clock in the morning is a good time to break sextants out and take your fix your ship by celestial navigation. And uh, so, and then you always take your noon sunshot. That's a big ocean. And if you don't figure out where you are, you could get lost and you might never see land again. So that dawns on you right quick. I mean, when you, you're sailing along and you get up this morning and you look out, in every direction you look, you have nothing but water. You get up 30 days later and you look out and all you see is water. But in history, I learned there's four-fifth water and fifth land or in the geography. And I thought, my God, I'm in that four-fifths part. So you go to realizing that, hey, all of this is necessary. And I was eager to learn. I'd never, yeah, I'd navigated many times with the stars. I'm out coon hunting. You look at the North Star, you can figure out how to get back home. And But I'd never thought about being as much water as there was out there, and there's nothing but water. Mm -hmm. So you kind of figure out, hey, uh, I might not have my Jesus shoes with me. I better figure out this stuff. I was fortunate. The navigating officer, I was eager to learn. The navigating officer kind of took me under his wing. And usually the assistant navigating officer is the most senior ensign you have aboard ship, or at least in our service. They're known as the bull ensign. Well, the navigating officer selected me to be his assistant. And uh, we happened to have civilian cartographers aboard that we did all down in the plotting room. We did all of that. Uh, that was kind of fun. And so those civilian cartographers taught me cartography. And it was, was interesting. Leave that ship, you hit the land assignments, back to sea, different parts of it. Uh, my second sea assignment, I was assigned as executive officer on a ship working Alaska. Hydrographic surveys, which include hydrography, tides, currents, gravity, magnetics. You measure it all because you need all of that in constructing an article chart. Plus all the shoreline mapping. You've got to do all of that. You've got to establish all your control. So it's a combined operation. You've got to put all that in. Uh, I was served on that as years uh, executive officer. And we get back in that fall, next January, I get a new assignment. I guess my commanding officer had recommended me, gave me a pretty good fitness report. And I was selected to be commanding officer of a larger vessel, sailing in about February, March. To be quite honest with you, it scared me. How old were you when this happened? Uh, I went to Alaska on the Jones, that's 1964. I was born in 37. So 64, I'd been in six years. Mm -hmm. I was basically 26, 27. You were in your mid-20s, yeah. yeah. And uh, That's pretty impressive. They, I was, they gave me command of the Coastal Jetic Service Ship buoy and uh, assigned me to, because Bangor 
naval base, Washington, subs, ships. Uh, they assigned me a project of conducting circulatory current surveys of Puget Sound, measuring the currents throughout Puget Sound to be used by maritime commerce, but also to be very useful with the Navy. We're the people that do that. The military uses a lot of it, but we do that. Uh, I got into it, doing that, enjoyed it very, very much, having a wonderful time, nothing better than having your own command. And got mail one day, and I've got a letter addressed to Lieutenant Wesley Hull from Washington, D.C. Man, I opened that thing up. Congratulations. We have selected you to receive graduate studies at Cornell University starting in September. And I thought, wait a minute. First of all, I had no idea where Cornell University was located. Secondly, I hadn't requested any advanced training. And so, first time we hit port, I contacted him. I said, hey, wait a minute. Y'all got this mixed up. I haven't requested this assignment. I've got, a, I've got my job. I like it. And he says, well, you know you do, but you've been selected and you're going to graduate school. I said, do I have a choice? They said, if you want to stay in the Corps, you don't, because we're going to send you to graduate school. See, I had worked in photogrammetry, shoreline mapping, control, and what have you. And I was selected to go to Cornell in the engineering school to get my master's with a major in photogrammetric and geodetic engineering. And so I gave up the job I loved. We hooked up our Volkswagen behind our station wagon and me and my wife and two kids, we headed to New York once we figured out where Cornell was located. Ithaca, New York, far above Cayuga's waters. <sighs> complete opposite end from coast to coast. And I must say, being a kid from Jimtown, going to that Ivy League school, you talk about a cultural shock. But you know, they got over it in about six months up there. So was it unusual? For, was, was Did they send several people from the military? Were they used to that sort of influx? Yes, but what usually happens people request graduate school. They told me I was going. Why do you think that they did that? <laughs> to get even with me. <laughs> <laughs> I've often wondered, and I asked after I got back there, and I was told by a captain, we looked at your record. And so, I got my master's there with a minor in industrial engineering, and I also uh, got over to Sage Graduate School, the business school, and I took the business courses because I figured if they've moved me, I've only had one ship assignment as a junior officer, and I've been exec and CO, I'm going to be moving into management, and I need some business courses. And so, uh, I had a my advisor, and uh, I spent a lot of midnight oil in graduate school. Some of the courses were pretty tough, and uh, made some good friends there, but long hours. But I uh, figured, hey, wait a minute. I'm just an old dumb kid from Jimtown, and I've been through OSU. I'm going to audit a sophomore calculus course to get back in the swing of things. Well, in the catalog, it was a sophomore calculus course, but when I signed up to audit it, they had moved it and made a freshman calculus course. Didn't bother me. I'd, I'd go to class with those freshmen. And it didn't take me couple of months to realize, are you sure this is calculus? And we had young kids in there, looked like they should be in high school, correcting the professor on some of it. And I thought, I'm in the wrong class. 
So I thought, hey, I can't learn anything in this calculus except how dumb I am. So I dropped the calculus course and uh, signed up for linear algebra. Figured I might need linear algebra more than I did calculus. And had no problem with linear algebra. That was wonderful. And I ordered about every course we could, but certain courses required, but I ordered other courses, hopefully to help me out some. Uh, me and a friend of mine who happened to be with the Canadian Genetic Survey, we got to be real good friends, so we'd, of course, out there, we'd go audit. And uh, so, graduated from that. In the summers, when school was out, Washington would pull me back and put me to work in Washington, D.C. at headquarters. When I got my degree, they assigned me as a research engineer in photogrammetry. And one of my main functions was to calibrate aerial cameras. And we designed a system to calibrate the lens of an aerial camera. I used to tell everybody the lens and camera is kind of like the bottom of a Coke bottle. You got different distortions depending on what part of the Coke bottle you're in. So we developed a system with a big concrete pier in the ground so we get stability. And we use the old uh, BC4 ballistic cameras that you'd have downrange to see the damage that we use that ballistic camera. And we could turn those up instead of looking down to take a picture. We would turn those up, take our lens, and we'd shoot a stellar background with the transit satellites. And we developed a chopping shutter so we could chop all those images. Knowing the right ascension of the stars pretty accurately, and knowing the ephemeral data of the transit satellites, we could do some post-processing. And through all of that and precise measurements, we could calibrate that aerial lens to get the radial asymmetric and tangential distortion that might be in that lens so we could correct any of the photogrammetric work we were doing, image refinement. In addition, we did film distortion because the film nine inch format, 250 foot rolls. They lay that emulsion on there. First thing you do when you develop it, you put it into liquid. So we said that's going to affect that emulsion, not necessarily the full length because you got a lot of it, but the narrow part, but we'd have to measure. So we did studies on that to develop what we call image coordinate refinement. So we could correct our images. Now we would measure all of that, we would take some of that and transfer it to an optical flat glass plate and we'd put it in our comparators and we would measure to microns. Now a micron is a millionth of a meter. You mash your fingers together, you've probably got some of them little fellers in there. But we would measure it to a millionth of a meter, to just kind of the type of action we look for. And I was having a great time in doing that research and was calibrating uh, cameras and then out of the clear blue said, uh, we have selected you for the U.S. Department of Commerce Science and Technology Fellowship Program. I said, duh. And so they explained what it was, and I thought that sounds pretty interesting. And what we do in that program, you go to government-owned, government-operated facilities, government-owned, private-operated facilities, private-owned, private-operated facilities, and you study all the management techniques that's used in all of these. Plus, in addition, you're down on the hill getting briefings of all sorts of stuff, work at, work at Brookings Institute in Washington. But you all have, also have to select a work period from another agency that you're not involved with. So I decided to go to the National Institute of Basic Standards, NIST, uh, the old Bureau of Standards and uh, Institute of Basic Standards, Metrology Division, Image Optics and Refractometry Section. That sounded interesting to me. So we did some basic research there in looking at lens calibration. And I recall one specific project uh, worked on was uh, aerial cameras that were in the nose cone of Navy fighters, or Navy fighters, or Navy bombers. After you hit your target, you go back with your cameras and look. 
But usually they, somebody may be down there kind of unset, upset with you, so they may be trying to get you, so you kind of pour the coal to it, and when you do, it kind of vibrates. So we looked at different mountings and calibrating those cameras so we could get good images on damage assessment. And uh, I looked at different ways to calibrate cameras and happened to be working with an individual, Dr. Francis Washer. Uh, he took a liking to me, took me under his wing, and we did some basic research in carrying this out. Uh, and probably somewhere he and I put papers together, technical papers, deliver them technical conferences of that nature. Uh, so I finished that up back in research and uh, one day the Admiral, I have to get on the elevator and the Admiral's on there, he says, oh, by the way, Hull, come on up my office, been wanting to talk to you. I thought, oh God, what have I done now? Ride the elevator up to his office, go into his office. He says, we've decided we're going to make you the executive officer of the oceanographer carrying out oceanographic research. I says, I don't feel I'm qualified on that. He says, we think otherwise. But I said, uh, that's a more senior position than I more senior rank than I have. He said, that don't bother us. Now, when I made lieutenant and was char put commanding officer, that billet was for a full commander. From a lieutenant, you go to a lieutenant commander, then a commander. As a lieutenant, they put me in a job. Consequently, some of the full commanders out there weren't too happy with me. They're saying I took the job. I didn't take the job. They made me take it. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to get out of going, and I finally said, okay, if that's a decision, i got to go. You know, in your military, they say, go, you go. This was in September. I said, when have we got to be out there? He says, in 30 days. I said, but i got a house here. i got to get to Seattle. i got to find a house. i got to get the kids in school. Yeah, we know all that. So uh, I went home and told my wife about it. She thought, what kind of blankety blank outfit you work for? But guess what? We made it to Seattle. We rented a six bedroom house, sighted and seen, because an individual had it who was back in Washington, had it. He found out I was going out there and he says, hey, I'll lease you this house. He says, I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let you live in this house. I'll rent this house to you. I says, what kind of lease? He says, how long are you going to be out there? He says, I don't know. He says, why would, I, why would I want you to sign a lease if you don't know how long you're going to be there? He says, I'm not going to penalize you. He says, you don't have to have a lease. So we rented that six-bedroom house. We got out there. You could sit in the second. It's two-story. You could sit in your living room, that big glass window, and overlook Puget Sound. Wonderful place. And uh, so... Was your wife a little bit appeased after she... Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so uh, we got there. I think I reported board on the 3rd of October. I think we sailed something like on the 5th. So she's got to do everything of that nature. How many and, kids did you have? Uh, two. Still just two. And uh, got back in. And the little one, she had entered her, enrolled in school, got a note from the teacher. Uh, we need a teacher's conference. Why do we need a teacher's conference? because your daughter has a speech impediment. I thought, we keep the appointment, we go up, meet with the teacher. I says, what makes you think my daughter's got a speech impediment? I'm sorry, sir, she don't have a speech impediment. I didn't know y'all were from the South. <laughs> no, really? <laughs> Honest to God. <laughs> And so my daughter didn't turn out to have a speech impediment. The teacher was very embarrassed. But I thanked her for paying that much attention. So where, I don't know anything about your wife up to this point. Maybe just give me a little bit of information about where she's from and where you all met. She's in Wood River, Oregon. Apple capital. A lot of apples. Fruit Valley. 
Uh, you stand in the valley of Hood River and you look up and you see Mount Hood. She graduated high school at Hood River and went on to Emanuel Hospital. Through the hospital, she became an RN. She's a diploma, uh, an RN trained by the hospital. Much more bedside experience than any of these nurses get today. And uh, while I was working the Columbia River, uh, when you live in Umatilla, Oregon, there's not a lot of places in Umatilla, Oregon. But there was Bill's Cafe. Uh, he served uh, rib steaks, three dollars for a meal. I ate at Bill's Cafe a whole lot. And there was a CCC Cafe, Columbia River Cafe. And uh, as it turned out, they had a bar, and I'd go down after work after I had my three dollar steak at Bill's Cafe. And I went in the bar one evening, and new bartender was there. And we got to talking. And he was in the Air Force. And it was his mother that owned the place. I'm back down there the next evening. We're talking about things. I've got somebody I can talk to. And uh, I don't know, on the third or fourth evening, I go down, and there's this young girl there. <laughs> he introduces me. She thought I knew him forever. <laughs> she didn't know we just met. So uh, she leaves. She goes back to Oregon. I'm pulled in the, we complete a project, I'm pulled in the Oregon office. I smart enough to get her name and phone number. And so we dated a while and uh, wound up getting married in 1960. And uh, the, uh, we'd planned to head out of Portland. We married in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. It was wanting to snow a little bit when we went in church. When we came out, it had snowed a whole lot. We got two feet of snow. We were stranded. And uh, so we finally got out of Portland in a day or two. And by that time, any leave I'd planned was up. So we had to return to Mount Vernon, Washington, where I was supporting a ship that was doing hydrography. I was doing all the tide work, control work, and photogrammetry for that ship. And from there, we just traveled everywhere. Uh, she worked for a while, but we moved so often uh, she couldn't continue, so she basically raised the kids since I was at sea. But when we went on the oceanographer, worked all over South America, went through the canal, worked Barbados, worked the Caribbean, and uh, down in the Caribbean we were doing sea area interaction studies. What effect does the action of the sea have on our meteorological conditions? because that has a big effect on weather forecasting. Mm -hmm. And so we did all of that research there. And then by the time we got back to Seattle now, the Navy and Coast Guard used to say, well, we wish we could drop down to no more six month deployment. We'd have been happy to have a six month deployment. Uh, we sailed one day the 13th of January out of Seattle I guess our next port, next port of call was Papier Tahiti, Papier to Tahiti, and probably the next one was Valparaiso, Chile. We were doing oceanographic research on continental drift, seafloor spreading, and worked as far south as 45 degrees. And we would bring on scientists. If you work in their waters, you've got to work with the government. So we'd bring on scientists from. Ecuador, Chile, and what have you. And that way, that gave us permission to work in their waters if we needed to. And we're working with the other countries. Mm. We're the guys, we're the good guys, we wear the white hats. So this was right. after you moved back to Seattle? Yeah, and from Seattle, after that job, we got off of that ship, and uh, they contacted me and they said, uh, this was 1970. Vietnam going pretty good. They say, you're needed at Fort Sill, field artillery. So we pack up and we moved to Fort Sill. They provided housing for us on Fort Sill. And I was on the commanding general staff, the assistant commandant staff, the secretary staff, uh, target acquisition, doing review and analysis of different type 
working on the staff of the Combat Developments Command and the staff of the Field Artillery Board. What that entailed, always looking for a better mousetrap. And since I had a new background in photogrammetry control, I went to looking. The Coast Survey has always been very close with the Army. Years ago, for artillery, they would shoot over, they'd shoot under. You had a forward observer spotting your artillery. You'd shoot over, you'd shoot under, you'd shoot to the right, you'd shoot to the left. And now that you've bracketed your target, you're going to fire that fifth shot for fire for effect. And like we told the Army, he said, hey, wait a minute. That enemy may be smarter than you give them credit for. They're going to figure out you're going to do that, and you fire four shots, they're gone. Because of the next one's coming after them. We said, we need to work it different. Let's get the position of the target. Let's get the position of our battery center. We'll compute you an inverse. We'll give you distance and direction. And knowing the characteristics of your cannon, you know what, how big a shell to put in it for how far it'll shoot. Fire one for effect. So it was Coast Survey officers that took our survey manuals and compiled the Army survey manuals from our survey manuals. And we worked extensively with the Army, especially artillery. Of course, we worked with the Navy and since it's 47 to the Air Force. And so what I did at Fort Sill, I knew there was going to be something up there eventually because for some reason, one of my Washington assignments, I was selected to a committee to develop a plan for a spacecraft oceanography. And we knew what parameters we measure. We were trying to figure out if there was a way to measure them from space better and cheaper and recover larger areas. So we put our heads together and basically developed a plan for spacecraft oceanography. So I knew of things that were happening. And some of the major projects I worked on at Fort Sill was developing what I refer to as a photogrammetric database. In other words, if we can reuse remote sensing, and if I can come up with that imagery, and if I can build me a database on that, and, well, I just to kill tanks. If I've got me a photogrammetric database, and I got me a tank commander here that tells me the route he's going to be taking, first of all, for my imagery, I'm going to determine his speed and speed of advance and a direction. But now then, that tank commander tells me he's going to be down here at that crossroads. Since I know his speed of advance, and I don't know the capability of my artillery, and I've got my photogrammetric database, I compute what time he's going to be here. And by the time he gets there, knock him out. Mm -hmm. We sat on the mountaintop down Fort Hood and demonstrated that. I worked with Engineering Topographic Command back in Belvoir, Virginia and Fort Sill to develop systems of that nature uh, to do new technology. Now then, if we brought something in, Combat Developments Command would develop it. We bring it into the inventory, the field artillery board, we're the people that test it. And now it's tested, meets all the tests, it comes into the inventory, then you get over target acquisition, where you help develop lesson plans to teach the GIs how to use it. So it's kind of a full circle. Another one of my jobs out there was compute the Army ephemeris. And I went back to Washington from the Naval Observatory and got the ephemeral data, all of the star information. And uh, I had worked with computers while I was at Cornell, as well as research back there in the 1620s, 80 column punch paper card, the old cards. And at times I was pretty good writing Fortran 4, stuff of that nature. Because you're doing research, you've got to have, uh, send a program out, you have five or six boxes, a bunch of cards, it's a whole bunch of cards. And so, they need the army ephemeris so they can 
use the stars up there to locate their battery center when there's nothing else around. But they work in radians, mills, and grads. And you know the rad ascension declination of 425 stars is pretty accurate. So you got to go in and write your, your uh, models to convert all of that and your equations to do all of that and publish your army ephemeris. Fort Sill didn't have a computer. I did it by hand. And then I went over to the survey department. The little secretary's name is Cindy. She types it. And then Cindy and I spend days together of proofing it. Because all of those numbers, you got to proof all of that after she types it. And that was before word processors. How long did it take you to compute all of that? I don't recall. I probably pulled my hair out a whole bunch. But then after we did that, after me and Cindy got it all proofed, it's ready to go. I take it over to the depart uh, DDLP, Doctor Literature Plans and DDLP. But the Director of Development Plans, or whatever DDLP stands for, mm -hmm. and they published it. And then it's disseminated out to the artillerist for the surveyors to use. And after I completed that one year, I checked and I said, does the artillery have any, is there any computer on Fort Sale? And they said, yes, the FADAC, the old field artillery computer. It's not a, it's not a scientific computer. So I went to Shepherd Air Force Base and talked to the general down there and I said, do you have scientific computers that you could let me use? Uh, no, we don't have any of those. So I go to Tinker, talk to the general up there. He says, yes, we have scientific computers. I said, I would like access to those so we can write programs and compute this dirty ephemeris by computer instead of doing it by hand. He said, I'll give you free access. I says, wonderful. He turned around and he says, you see this blank wall behind my desk? Yes, sir. He says, I know you operate photogrammetric aircraft. I'd like a large photograph of my base that I can put behind my desk here. You give me that, you have access to computers. I get on the phone because I had been in charge of the coastal mapping photogrammetry back there. I get on the phone and I said, when's 8-9 Sugar coming this way? 8-9 Sugar's tail number of photographic air, is Aero Commander. They said, matter of fact, he's leaving in two days, coming out to uh, Will Rogers for maintenance. Don't take the cameras out. This is what I want. And they said, we can do that. I get back to the general. I said, okay, 8-9 Sugar is going to be reporting in. We can only fly sun angles a certain time, cloud cover and all of that. When they get here, and all of this is in, we got everything set. When they call your control tower, I want everything shut down. I want access, because I don't want to be putting holding patterns, all those AWACs flying out of there and everything else. And he gave me some numbers. He says, call these numbers, you'll have it. Plane comes in, they do their thing, they land out at, uh, at uh, Will Rogers. They call me at Fort Sill, says, hey, we've got it. We'll get the film shipped back for processing in Washington. They says, what size? I says, give me some 3X. In 9x9 nine nine format, so we're going to come up with photographs like so. And I says, you give me some verticals and obliques? They says, we got you some good ones. So as soon as it got processed and printed, I got a roll, Fort Sill. I go over to Motor Pool and they sign me a driver and a car, and here we go, and I deliver those natural color photography to the Air Force General at Tinker. I've kept my part, he kept his. We put the Army ephemeris on the computer at Tinker Air Force Base. Now, as you know, what happened to computers all that time? This was in 71 or 72. That's how we, we got that on there. Mm -hmm. That was quite an accomplishment of, of getting it. I think we might have wrote it in Fort Tranfor, I don't recall. And uh, so uh, the uh, 
back to Washington from Fort Sill. They pulled me back to Washington. So were you living in Fort Sill? Yes, we lived yeah. uh, 1311 Shanklin Circle, Fort Sill. <laughs> I can't believe you remember all this. So you moved from Seattle to Fort to Sill. To Fort Sill. Fort Sill, back to Washington. Mm -hmm. And Was it interesting for you to be back in Oklahoma for that period of time? Yes, because if I didn't have to work that weekend, I was in Jimtown. Mm -hmm. uh, Red River down there has got some nice catfish in it. <laughs> Were your parents still alive? Yeah, parents still alive. And uh, weekends I couldn't make it home. They'd come up and visit us at Fort Sale. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, it was good to be back with family because my family's basically here in southern Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Had you been able to stay in contact with them much while you were traveling around the world? The, I would send postcards from out in the Pacific. It may take a long time to get there because I may write them. At, mm -hmm. We may hit Anna We Talk. I get postcards. We sailed, and I fill out these postcards. And next time we get to Anna We Talk, well, you hopefully you get it mailed because there wasn't a lot of mail boys out in the ocean there. Drop your mail off and pick it up. And uh, but back in Washington, and then uh, all of a sudden they said no, we're going to make you the associate director of oceanography and uh, uh, marine services. So I basically, uh, it was a new office they're setting up. I basically set that office up to get it operating and operating ships, acquiring data, and having a good time. And then uh, one day they called me up and said, uh, we're sending you to Norfolk. We're going to promote you to Rear Admiral, and we're going to send you to Norfolk. Now that was Rear Admiral lower half, one star. However, the Maritime, Navy, Coast Guard, and everything, even though we had one star, we wore the uniform of two stars. Why is that? That's the way the system worked, same way the Navy worked. And it's supposed to be called Commodore, is a one star. But then the Navy had a problem with that. We went back to Commodore for a while. Navy had a problem, says we got a Commodore of the fleet, and they're not necessarily one star. And of course, the other services complain, hey, wait a minute, you seagoing folks, you're only a one star, but you wear a uniform of two stars. So finally, all the Maritimes get together and change back. We was always, we draw the, drew the pay of one star, but you wore the uniform of two stars. Today, we're back to the lower half and upper half, and a one star wears just one band of a, of a one star and the two star. So it changed over tradition back and forth. and uh, But uh, we, the Navy, the Coast Guard, and Public Health Service are all the, the same in that regard. And so uh, went to uh, Norfolk. They'd never had an official change of command. And uh, one of the young officers down there contacted me. He was a commander, and he was going to be working for me. He said, I think it's time we bring a little tradition back in. Would you be okay if you uh, work with me and set up a form of change of command? I says, well, that's what it is and it should be. So uh, we set up a form of change of command ceremony, all the dignitaries around Norfolk. Uh, he got the Navy band to play from Norfolk and brought a cannon over from the Navy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had the form of change and all the cake cutting and what have you. And as it was over, the band broke up playing Oklahoma. <laughs> Give you an interesting story about Oklahoma. Out in Pacific somewhere, I don't recall exactly where we were tied up, but I think it might have been, we might have been tied up in Honolulu. But uh, I noticed a rather large gentleman walking the dock looking us over. And he looked like he might be somebody, so I just go down and introduce myself. And he introduces himself. He was the Prime Minister of Fiji, visiting Hawaii. So, I invite him aboard for lunch. He accepts. So we have the Prime Minister, great big tall guy. I can't, couldn't pronounce it, I couldn't call his name, sure can't pronounce it. But anyway, bring him on for lunch. And we're in the wardroom where the officers eat. And I don't know, we had 12, 15 officers around the table. 
and we're having lunch, and uh, we serve pretty formal lunches on. I mean, you you have your your white tablecloths, your white napkins, your several course meal. It's just tradition, and especially since I had the prime minister Fiji the mess department, and so we're eating there, and he said, uh, "I'd like to know if you just go around the table and tell me what part of the United States you're from." And tell me a little about yourself. So he starts and goes down. He's, I'm Mississippi. I'm from Connecticut. Or I'm from California. All the way around, it comes around to me. And being exact, I'm at the head of the table, and he's immediately on my right, the place of honor. And he says, and what about you? I says, I'm from Oklahoma. Oh, I know Oklahoma. You have a beautiful song. <laughs> That's from Prime Minister Peachy. He knew of Oklahoma. And he could even sing part of it. <laughs> Gordon McRae, he remembers singing that song. Oh, I can believe it. <laughs> so uh, Prime Minister Fiji had heard about us. And, but uh, then uh, me and my wife bought a big house. I looked over in Norfolk and I said, I'm going to be down here. I'm going to buy a house in the highest elevation, Kempsville, 20 foot. And uh, because I looked at some, some beautiful homes, but I knew get a storm down through there, you're going to be flooded. So we bought out in Kempsville, took a big two-story home, because we said we're going to retire from here. Beautiful place, Virginia Beach. Well, it didn't work that way. Now, while I was in Norfolk, it came time for the rededication of the Statue of Liberty. So I was kind of told, uh, you bring this because we're working all foreign ships, sailing ships, Navy ships and everything were taken to New York Harbor. And so I thought we should have a special nautical chart. So we made the nautical charts a little larger and put down the side commemorating the Statue of Liberty from the French on forward and everything. Really, really ended up nice. I coordinated all the foreign ships and everything. And the Secretary of Commerce was on our ship. We took up, we took the uh, researcher out of uh, Miami. And uh, we were kind of the, since I was kind of charge and you kind of have where you get to anchor, we were kind of the point. And uh, so we had a big event there with all these foreign countries coming in with their ships and uh, all the Navy coming in and uh, we rededicated the Statue of Liberty. Oh, uh, that was in uh, either 85 or 86, I guess. So we had all of that, that set up. Mm -hmm. And about the time I was thinking about getting around to retiring, I got a phone call, we're pulling you to Washington. I said, oh no, let me retire here. They said, nope, we're pulling you back to Washington for four years. So they pulled me back up there as the Director of Charting and Genetic Services, where I was responsible for all the nautical charting, all the aeronautical charting, all the photogrammetry shoreline mapping, and all of the genetic control. And uh, so I spent four years there. In that position, I was the United States hydrographer. I represented the United States in the international community. Uh, at that time, 57 other countries with hydrographic matters. And for setting standards, me and my staff, staff we represented the United States which wasn't too bad, no kid from Jimtown, and all of a sudden you're representing the United States. How did you feel when they told you that's what your sort of last station was going to be? I mean, because they said four years, you were thinking retirement, you could kind of infer that this was well, probably what you were going to end on. The well, at 30 years, you get, uh, uh, first of all, it, you get 2.5% a year, 20 years you get 2.5% a year, so that's basically 50% of your, your base pay. Your last kicker is 26 years. If you get 26 years, you're not going to get any more increases. And you spend 30 years, or after that 26 years, you'll get up to 75% of your base pay. So I was hoping to retire with about 28 years. My maximum I was going to get, live in Norfolk, got the house in a nice place. But... I counted up four years, and I said, well, that'll be, I'll have 32 years in, and that's enough. Because by that time, both of my kids had completed OU, 
my daughter was living here in Ardmore working for the hospital. They'd had a little one. I couldn't come home for Christmas, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, when my four years are up, I'm gone. And, uh, but it was a, a wonderful job back there. You get to work across government everywhere with the others. And just before I retired, that's when Saddam invaded Kuwait. So we have standing memorandum of agreement with defense. If needed, we're there. Uh, the Marine liaison officer at Fort Sill while I was there, he knew of us quite well. He says in World War II, every Marine Survey Battalion was commanded by a Coast and Genetic Survey Officer. And uh, our ships were taken over by the Navy, gun tubs put on them, Navy gunners put on them, and we went before the fleet to make hydrographic surveys for the Navy fleets all of Alaska. The only data we had in several areas of Alaska is what we got when we bought it from, bought Alaska from Russia. And so... That was while you were the U.S. hydrographer? Is that what? No, 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 that's World War II. Oh, that was in World War that's II, World okay. World War II. And the, but in World War II, our ships went in areas of Alaska, performed the hydrographic surveys, and then served as pilots to bring the Navy ships in for safe anchorage out in, especially out in the Aleutians. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, but uh, one of our ships, the Pathfinder, Admiral Nimitz always said the road to Tokyo is paved with Pathfinder charts because the Pathfinder was there under Nimitz performing hydrographic surveys. And the Navy did put gun tubs on them and we probably had 50 calibers. But that's the only protection. You're basically unprotected out there. Now, this is going to show my ignorance, but is it... The reason why you were put in front during those sorts of times was that to check for underwater, like submarines and things like that? Well, or no, you're, you're, is the water or... safe to sail in? Oh, is the water safe to sail in? Okay. You're looking for navigation. Is the water safe to sail in? I see. So you've got to be kind of there in front of the whole thing. Yeah. And But the officers, most of our officers were transferred to the Navy, Army, Marine Corps during World War II. They can still be transferred by... He had by signature of the president. We can. We had a ship off of Kuwait, and uh, then when we went into Iraq, we had people in Iraq because we are geodesists. We're surveyors. We need a geodetic network, and so working with the military, we establish a geodetic network. So we're heavily involved with DOD. So what was your job function for that? I mean, like what? Well, I was retired by the time. On, on Kuwait, uh, I immediately, since we have standing MOUs and I operated two five-color printing presses, I immediately went in to a printing operation. I was always doing it specifically for DOD charts. Uh, I printed six days a week, used the seventh day for maintenance and to produce aeronautical charts because certain aeronautical charts we have to get out on a time frame or it can affect air transportation immensely. And so we, I used that seventh day for maintenance of my presses and to get out my critical aeronautical charts. I basically stopped production on nautical charts. And the Defense Department would back up to our loading the docks of the morning, offload a truck of paper, unload a truck of charts. We'd run 24 hours a day. And I don't know where you remember General Schwarzkopf giving all of his briefings and that, all of those big maps and charts, you're looking at the guy that probably printed them. We printed all of those. Uh, we did one other thing. When I was in oceanography, Aramco, the oil company, came to us and says, we're drilling in the Persian Gulf. We need tidal information. Can we pay y'all and you come over and install it? And we said, uh, it can't work that way. That's out of our area of responsibility. I said, however, if you need it and you do it to our standards, we will train you on your dollar. They bought the equipment we used, so we're processing. We trained them on their dollar 
how to operate, take care of the data. I said, then I will process it and give you the data you need, but I keep the original. They said, fair enough. So we trained Aramco how to operate to our standards, process the data that's in my database. And I started producing some of that in our predicted tide tables. Along comes the invasion. DOD didn't have all that tide information. They immediately contacted me. I said, oh, I got some of that. Immediately, things started happening. I've got it in the database. I've got the tidal information that's needed because if you're going to make beach landings, you need tide information. And I started working with the Defense Mapping Agency because we're photogrammetrists and we work with different sources. And we assisted them in producing the amphibious, amphibious assault charts for Kuwait because they were going to fool Saddam to make him think we were going in by amphibious landing, which we could. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were prepared to do that. And uh, so we were heavily involved in that. I was heavily involved in that. All of that's green door activities. So we were in the planning long before the American people knew what was happening. And, uh, but it turned out to be very successful to get him out of, out of Kuwait. Mm -hmm. Did you have an inkling that that's part of what your job would be as U.S. Hydro hydrographer? When I left, when I joined the Corps, I didn't know such thing existed. What about when you took the job? When they said oh, when they when called took, you up and they said when I took the job, I knew it would be. You knew that you had, you had a good inkling of what you were accepting. Yeah, I knew I knew what I was accepting because I'd been around long enough to mm -hmm. know the system, and I knew that's that's what it was. Did you have any reservations about accepting it? Mm. I figured, hey, it's been done before. I can do it too. <laughs> There's one other thing. When I accepted that job uh, shortly after that, I got a nomination from President Reagan appointing me to the Mississippi River Commission of Navigation mm -hmm. and uh, flood control up and down the Mississippi. So you did that too? I was uh, on the Mississippi River Commission, I guess, close to four years. And uh, we made two trips a year. We'd usually join the ship around Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And uh, we'd make a high water inspection trip and a low water inspection trip. Uh, we'd go into New Orleans on one of those trips. Then we'd cut off and go down to Chaffalaya and go into Fort Morgan, or Morgan City. Morgan City on the other trip, but uh, for flood control and navigation. And of course, you know, we've tried to control Mississippi. You don't mess with Mother Nature too much. But uh, we were responsible for looking at, to keep it open for navigation. We were responsible for looking, what if we have a major flood in all these levees? What do we have to blow to relieve that water? That's part of the commission's job. And also back in there, what do we do? How are we prepared? What do we do if there's another earthquake, which there will be in New Madrid? You know, New Madrid, Missouri, 1911, one of the worst earthquakes there was. Someday it's gonna happen again. That's when the Mississippi ran backwards. Uh, that was an interesting, interesting job on that, that commission. How, that seems a lot different than what you were doing with all of your oceanic stuff. First of all, you got to look at, uh, you got to have charts of the Mississippi. You got to look at dredging the Mississippi to keep it open to traffic. And you got to look at flood control. And so it's kind of all built in because, after all, if you're going to build a levee, you're going to build anything, you need control. So uh, it fits right in with what we do. Mm -hmm. Now we are responsible, NOAA is responsible for charting U.S. waters to the head of tidal influence. Then basically it takes over from the Corps of Engineers, does the other waterways. However, in the reorganization, reorganization number four, 1970, they took the U.S. Lake Survey from the Corps of Engineers and put that under the Coast Survey creating NOAA, 
So I was responsible for doing all the nautical charting in the lake survey. Since that's both, you get on the north side, you got Canadian. You get west, you get east, you got the Canadian boundary. In my position, I was also the co-chair of the U.S. Canada Hydrographic Commission. So I had to work with the Canadian hydrographer. We set policy. We would write that policy and basically tell the State Department this is our policy when it comes to this. We would jointly work if we if we had requirements for surveys and boundary waters. We would work both sides of the boundary. If I were using a Canadian ship, I'd have an officer aboard that Canadian ship to talk to our customs people. And if they were on our ship, they'd have a Canadian officer on there to work with the Canadians. Plus, you go on out to the boundary seaward between Canada and the U.S. fishing. You got the Canadian Coast Guard, you got the U.S. Coast Guard. The Coast Guard enforces our boundary. Mm -hmm. That Canadian fisherman gets over, bingo, we got him. That American fisherman, Coast Guard's got him. It was getting to be a real sticky problem between our two state departments. Me and my counterpart in Canada, the hydro Canadian hydrographer, he's civilian, he says, wait a minute, our State Department's going to get us at war and we won't be friends any longer. So we collectively wrote the two State Departments and says we are going to solve the problem. And basically what it was was fixing your vessels, what's your position, you get in certain areas, lower end, the control wasn't too good, lower end wasn't too good. So Ross Douglas, my counterpart there, his senior staff and my senior staff, we developed the policy for those boundary waters, especially on the East Coast. We wouldn't have any problem on the West Coast. We developed that policy because we were two professionals. We had a job to do. We developed that policy and convinced the state, state departments to accept it. Was it hard to convince them that? Uh, for a while it was because you're into somebody else's turf. But you just got to be persistent. And uh, the there's two things you kind of learn. And matter of fact, I think OSU helped quite a bit on it. Because if you're going to be an engineer, it's professionalism. And if you're going to be an engineer, you work on factual information. I think our universities has changed considerably from what it was when I was in there. And I don't think it's for the better. And But professionalism and factual information. And you can ask Kevin or Lisa, you can ask Kevin one or two things I push right here. Professionalism and factual information. Your curator here now. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so uh, it's, uh, I think that's part of OSU training. Mm -hmm. We had wonderful professors up there. Jean J. Tuma was our thin shell. He was our seven-hour thin shell structures professor. And Professor Flanders, our basically our strength of materials mm -hmm. guy. Wonderful, wonderful people. And some of those you just remember. <laughs> you have a good memory for names, but you you. So, it's good that you can pull those people out. The. Um, uh, but uh, since I retired, I. I'm known in the community because they know that, well, such as you saw the architectural renderings. Mm -hmm. Like I told the board, like I've told our foundations, there's only one way I know to do it, and that's in a professional manner. Everything will be done professionally. For the capital campaign, you're, you're For starting the capital campaign, now it'll to be done expand the museum. Mm -hmm. All codes will be met. I've worked with the city, said this is what I'm doing. Uh, tell me right now if you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you've got a major problem, well, I'll see if I can find somebody else to take your job. <laughs> <laughs> the city's wonderful down there. We work with the city very, very well. So I want the great people. I want to ask you something that I think actually illustrates um, illustrates that in the in the sort of respect that your peers have granted you, and that's what we talked about before we started the interview. The um, Bad metric map. Hall Canyon. Uh, yeah, can you tell me a little bit about 
Um, I'm going to take some pictures of it just so we have what we're talking about. But tell me a little bit about the discovery and sort of the mapping and the significance of the name for for that well, canyon. In, in nautical charting, we continue to review all of our waters. If the Joint Chiefs come in with a requirement, naturally that moves up to number one. And while I was in Norfolk, I had ships operating off South America on defense dollars because that's the area, not mine. But we've got the know-how to do it. And so they come to us and we do that. And I had a committee to review working with the maritime community and looking at what development may be coming. Do I need new hydrographic surveys in this area, this area, this area? So we set kind of a priority. We've got so many 3.4 million square nautical miles to cover. So we set priorities. They can always be flexible if something jumps out that we didn't know about. And when I was commanding officer of the Mount Mitchell based out of Norfolk, Virginia, one of the priorities they set was the East Coast, basically from New York down to about Norfolk. And really the main areas is the approaches to Delaware Bay, New York Harbor, and Norfolk. And they assigned me that project. They give me my project limits. And they tell me the knowing what scale of chart we're going to produce, that tells us the scale of the field work we need to do. Because you can't just go out and do hydrography at one scale, then produce it at something else. You've got to look at the scale that's going to fit your final product. And we have our hydrographic manual, our guideline that we go by. And if you're assigned to different scale sheets, that tells you the spacing of your sounding lines. You set up your control to control your vessel. And we will run normal or parallel or perpendicular to the depth curves because you can delineate the bottom much better by running perpendicular to the depth curves. If you run parallel, you may be running close to the 20 fathom depth curve and you don't get much delineation. But if you run perpendicular to it, you're going to get the ups and downs. So that's all in our guidelines, how to do it. And we've developed those guidelines over the years. Now the commanding officer has a license to vary what you may find out there. If you go to finding, at least you can always decrease the spacing on your lines for developments. If you can prove to headquarters that I can, I've got a flat bottom out and extend my lines out, well, they may or may not approve it. But you, you've got the discretion to change. And when I had the commanding officer surveying in that area, based out of Norfolk, I would go out and just plow the field. You run out to the limit of your survey, inshore to the limit, move over a couple hundred meters and go back. And just keep going back and forth. But now then we have a requirement. I don't know at all my lines I run parallel to each other are accurate. So what we do, we run cross lines. In other words, I may this may be this table now, I'm gonna run diagonals across here. And we run a certain percentage of cross lines, which is a quality check on all of these other lines. And it plots out real time. So you can always see the depth of the water. It hasn't been refined yet because we've got to go in and apply the uh, salinity and all of this later. Some of it may be refined because we may have getting something real time and we built it in the computer. But we've got those numbers. That may be refined when it goes through verification, but your numbers are good. They're all relation to one another. And as you go to looking, you kind of draw your depth curves so you can see what requirement do I have? Is our standard fulfilling this? So when I went to running in that area, I went to drawing these get depth curves and I says, wait a minute, that's not shown on my nautical chart. So I keep decreasing spacing, I'm running a more dense sounding to develop that area. And I'm just doing my job. 
So I developed that area, and on my what I call my field sheet, my boat sheet, I've delineated me a, a canyon that's nowhere there. But as a hydrographer, I satisfy my requirements that I have adequately delineated that feature. Okay, now then, what we do, we assign our young officers, or our officers, that's your boat sheet. You've got to do all the documentation and you've got to write a descriptive report. Everything you've done on there. If you found a, a shoal, you found a rock, that's all delineated. We scale a position, everything on it. And so in this descriptive report, we write up what we did and we've delineated the canyon and we give the geographic coordinates so anybody can look and, and find that. Okay, you've done your job. You submit that into the office for verification. They go through all the records. They're doing more checking. It goes through all the verification. And I had a big verification office in Norfolk. And had one in Seattle. But then it comes into headquarters. And they look it over and they go to making select soundings. You can't put everything together on a nautical chart. They've got to get a representative and you always want your lease sounding and you want your features shown. So when it gets to the verification, they say, well, wait a minute. They're comparing it to the existing nautical chart. This is not here. Hey, that's never been found before. Look what Mount Mitchell did. They write their verification report. They outline this also. Then it comes on into the verification people in Washington, the compilers that get ready. Now the report they write, hey, wait a minute, we've got a new feature to add to here, and they write the differences between the field work there and what's on the nautical chart because you always got to compare because you're going to be changing data on the existing nautical chart. And these reports go in, and eventually it's published. Okay, now we've got a new canyon. That feature needs a name. So the information goes in. They've got to verify. They've got to see the document. They've got to verify who found it, who's found this thing. So it gets into the Board of Geographic Names, now, a recommendation can go in to name it a certain thing. They may or may not accept it, the Board of Geographic Names. Who puts in the recommendation? Usually the agency may put it in. Uh, sometimes, depending on where it is, it may be in an area that we've got new products with a geological survey. We're responsible for the water stuff. They're responsible for the land except on our nautical charts. We're responsible for the need limits on that. But we share that data between the, the two agencies. It can be a total outside individual. There may no, be no recommendation go in. But uh, that recommendation goes in. That's evaluated by the Board of Geographic Names. First of all, they look at, do we have a, that name somewhere else? And they vote. And I don't know, maybe they selected whole because it's a four-letter word. I don't know. But uh, what I found unusual when they presented that to me at my retirement ceremony, I was shocked because I've done a lot of geographic names investigations for years and you make recommendations what it's going to be. And, uh, but usually for features of, of that nature, it's large features, you usually name it after a famous deceased person. Uh, that didn't happen. I'm still kicking. <laughs> I know your description. Well, it's, a, it's right in between Washington Canyon and, and Norfolk Canyon. Norfolk Canyon, which I, it's kind of telling in itself right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Halfway between Washington and Norfolk. <laughs> and I was, I was lucky. I was very fortunate to take an old country boy from Jimtown, born at Oswald, graduated at Leon, nine in her class, go through MIT, OSU, first of all, to become the United States hydrographer, the spokesman for the United States, secondly, to retire with the rank of a two-star rear admiral. I was fortunate. Well, you, you earned and, it, too. <laughs> and so, uh, but uh, the... Uh, one of my requirements, I kind of like to do research and write technical papers. And uh, especially since I've retired, 
the U.S. Department of Justice. If there's a ship grounding, they've got my phone number. The We had the tanker vessel Glacier Bay ground in Cook Inlet. That was in, I believe, 88, 88 or 89 before I retired. And the Glacier Bay sued the United States government for inadequate charts. Said chart information is wrong. That was, I believe, 55 million. And uh, before I retired, we had some discovery hearings that I, as the agency, uh, justice had me in court in Alaska over the pre-trial hearings and all of that other stuff in that regard. After I retired, they retained me as a technical advisor and expert witness. And when you have something like that, you have to go back all the way to see when the hydrography, when was the data acquired. You look at everything as far as its adequacy. You pull out the original phanograms to see the bottom trace. You walk through every one of your guidelines of what your guidelines tell you, whether you should do it or it shall be done. And if it shall, we use the common usage of the English language. If it shall, you don't have any choice. And uh, the one air, the area in Alaska, we've got on the nautical chart in certain areas, large boulders, many of them rising as much as 30 foot off the bottom, and they move from time to time. And there's a cautionary notes for mariners, don't enter at low water if you draw a certain amount in here. Well, there was a ship going into a, a refinery dock up there. He went in and anchored just fine. But then when uh, there's seven knots current in Cook Inlet. So as he swung, it went bump in the night. And it swung around to a 30 foot boulder, exactly what the chart said, many of them 30 foot. And we've got all kinds of cautionary notes that there's many uncharted rocks out there. He totally ignored all of our advice and punched a hole in the bottom, uh, shut down a $200 million salmon fishing industry. I think uh, spilled 110 barrels of crude. And uh, we were in Alaska and then it was moved to uh, Judge Holland in San Francisco. Judge Holland, have you ever heard of Sarah Jane Moore? Have you heard of Jimmy Carter? Yes. Sarah Jane Moore is the one that attempted to assassinate Jimmy Carter. Judge Holland is the one that made a ruling on Sarah Jane Moore. And uh, so the other side, the Glacier Bay, their expert was saying that it was a side echo looking at the phathogram. And I totally disagreed. And uh, Justice Attorney asked me, I said, it is a hard hit, it's not a side echo. It is the bottom, it's a hard hit. Because we had a rock charted right there. And so the judge turned to me and he says, Mr. Mr. Witness, can you give me an example of a side echo? I said, yes, Your Honor. And I grabbed the hydrographic book to pull it out. He said, no, give it to me in the morning. So I got back to the motel, I took it out and found me a place to Xerox it, copied it and uh, went back to court the next morning. I had that with me. He told me to write it to him. I gave it to him. Oh man, the justice attorney jumped up and called for a short recess and what have you. What do you mean giving that to the judge? I didn't see that. I said, well, if you read the book, you'd seen it. I says, the judge didn't tell me to go through you and give him something. He told me to give it to him and I did. And I said, don't worry about it, it's good, no, no question. But the justice attorney gets all upset. But anyway, the judge looked at what I gave him as a, a side echo, a real side echo, factual information. And we won that $55 million case by the judge saying, it is not a side echo, it is a hard hit, the chart is accurate. One little word, a hard hit. Mm -hmm. Now then, in 97, the QE2 grounded off Vineyard Sound. They sued us for $52 million. And that was after you were retired. After I retired. 
Peter Frost, U.S. Department of Justice, immediately called me. The Justice Headquarters. And Judge Holland was after I retired there. And so the QE2 grounded there. He called me. He said, will you be our technical advisor and have me set up the case? And I said, well, he didn't want to, but I guess so. And what they did, the ship totally underestimated what people do. They brought a load of tourists in, put small boats over, put them ashore at Vineyard Sound, and let them see the countryside, all the curio shops and what have you. And you get a bunch of tourists just kind of like herding a bunch of cats. You can't get them back on those boats at the same time, so consequently you're going to be late. You better build that in, but they didn't. So now they're late by the time they get the boats back on, all the tourists back on. QE2, a foreign vessel requirement, the Coast Guard's got to have a pilot on board. They got to be at their next port of call on a certain time. They're already late. They bring the pilot on, sitting still, they're drawing 32 foot, four inches. And they're heading out, and the pilot starts changing course without notifying the navigator, so you don't know exactly where you turned or anything, so you lose your, the pilot, but he, he wasn't overridden by the captain, so the, the skipper is irresponsible. I mean, he is inescapably responsible in U.S. waters. There's only two places where a pilot takes over and he's responsible, but not in U.S. waters. So the pilot kept changing course and running 25 knots, and pretty soon it goes bump in the night. So when Justice called me, they says he is drawing 34 foot, and the shoulder sounding out there is 39 feet. I said, well, I don't mean anything. I said, how long the vessel? He says, 960. I said, have a bogus valve? He says, yes. And I said, what was his speed? He says, 25 knots. I said, settlement squat got him. The just turned and says, what? I said, settlement squat? He says, what's that? So I started explaining to him. He says, you're going to be my expert on settlement squat. I said, no, I'm not. Uh -uh. I'm just telling you what it is. He says, what do you think it would be on that? I says, at least eight feet. And so the best way I could explain to him, I says, okay, you got your little speedboat out here. You're sitting dead in the water. You got to draft so much. Now you throw that throttle up there, the bow comes up, the stern goes down. Your draft is still the same, but you're sitting much deeper in the water. Settlement squat. And I says, on all of our survey boats and everything, we run settlement squat tests. That is applied to our soundings. We run it at various speeds and see the change. I said, what you need to do is get that information in David Taylor Model Basin, change, names changed, there uh, near Washington, and have a, a settlement squat test run. Canard Lines was having it run in England. They got the results. And guess what it come out? Eight feet, both in the UK and in the US. I guessed it, it got eight feet. <laughs> so they're drawing 32 foot four, you had you add eight feet to it, that makes it 40 feet. The rock only goes a foot up and tears the hull open. Mm -hmm. And I looked up the records. That 39-foot sounding came from a flashing fathometer in 1939. And what that is, it's got a glass bubble around it. As it goes around, it flashes at the depth. A guy sitting there, he reads it. The recorder's reading it. Does a great job. That's when they made wooden ships and men of iron. Mm -hmm. And so the other side was claiming it was a shoal and the survey didn't do adequate development. And the judge was about to believe him. So comes my time, New York City, and they quizzed me about a shoal and I says, not a shoal, so the judge just chopped it. He says, Mr. Witness, what's your definition of a shoal? I turned to him, I said, Your Honor, a shoal is a shallow spot in the sea, consisting of any material other than rock or coral. Detached from the shore, and it could be a minute to surface navigation. Recess 15 minutes. He comes back in 15 minutes, he opens his book up, he's referred to Black's Law Dictionary, he's referred to Webster and all these other things, he calls this out for the record. He says, they give the same definition as the witness gave. It is not a shoal. I don't want you to mention Shoal again. One fifty-two million dollars. No wonder they keep calling you. The uh, a pulp carrier ran aground off Coos Bay. Mm -hmm. She went to come in, coming in between. The, a pilot has to take it. Foreign ship, Japanese ship, coming in, pick up wood pulp out of Coos Bay at the lumber mills there, take it back and mash it, come back and sell it to us as fiberboard. 
<laughs> so it was too rough. Gale force winds, 26 foot seas, and it was too rough to bring him in between the jetties. So they told him it's too rough, pilot can't come out, lay off till the weather dies down. Now if you look at the Pacific, it's a long way to the other side, so it's a long fetch for that ocean to build up. 39 knot winds, I think it was 26 foot seas with a two foot chop on top of those. And the wind was blowing on shore. So they go out and they anchor in about 100 fathoms of water. Didn't put out adequate anchor chain. But now they're anchored waiting for the weather to die down. The shore's back here and the wind's blowing that way. They went to bed early the next morning. Chief mate got up, a cup of coffee, walked out deck and he said, where do those trees come from? Come to find out that ship was rocking like this and it basically walked that anchor. It would pull that chain and anchor off the bottom and go and they were just about to run ashore. So they got everything online and brought her around to head out, but they overran their anchor. The anchor's back here and the ship's trying to go this way. They can't get the anchor up. He could slacked off a little bit and pull it up and kept power on her and back off and got it up and he could head it out, but he didn't. For whatever reason, the skipper decided to turn hard right parallel to the beach. And since he turned that way, he'd get his anchor up. But he turns parallel to the beach, 39 knot winds blowing him on shore, runs him ashore. And he went ashore, bow first. So, uh, Coos Bay, Oregon, the state attorney general retained me and the U.S. Department of Justice retained me. And we're going along and they're arguing back and forth. I turned to the judge. I says, Your Honor, it's something funny to me. I says, We have a ship that runs aground, bow first, both anchors in the hawse pipes, and they're claiming it's somebody else's fault. Good point, Mr. Witness. We won our case. We wound up with 10 million because the only way I'd want to settle is to get what it cost the Navy, the Coast Guard for all that and to pay what government had paid me. Mm -hmm. So the shipping company got zero. We wound up with 10 million. I, this is interesting for a couple of different, well, it's interesting on multiple levels, but I'm curious because when you retired, this is most of this is after you retired. So this is sort of like your expertise have been kept in sort of quasi-retention. Mm -hmm. Right. So you moved, you, when you retired, you all came to Ardmore. Mm -hmm. What brought you to Ardmore? It seems pretty far removed from a lot of the places you had lived the majority of your career. Well, the, I thought I wanted to settle at Fort Sale. And we couldn't find a house up there that we liked, and I didn't like how close they were. That the houses were too close together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... We just didn't like that area. We enjoyed it at Fort Sill while we were there. So I said, well, go to Tulsa. So we went over to look at the house at Tulsa and they built them even closer to Fort Sill. And I said, I'm gonna read, rule that out. I don't like that. So I started to buy at uh, all the big golf course there in Oklahoma City, uh, out in Edmond. We found a house we liked very much, but it backed right up the golf course right there and I thought they'd be knocking my windows out or hit me on the head of the golf ball but we liked the house and I said well I don't like it up here but I bought the plans of that house and I came down here and met a builder and I says hey if I can find some land why are you charging me for this he happened to, have, he happened to own the, the lot so I bought the lot from him he built her house here so in Ardmore why Ardmore? Well, that brought us a little closer to family. And I said, if we settle off, we won't see much of family. If you lose your family, you've lost everything. In southern Oklahoma, that's where our family is. And I said, we're going to come back, so we'll be a family. And that's the reason we settled in Ardmore. So is your daughter still here? Is that what? She was, she was here. Yeah. Our son was in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. My mother and dad, uh, my mother was still living. Uh, my sister lives down in Love County. A lot of relatives out in Love County in the western part of Carter County. So was this 91 or 92? Uh, I, remember what you said. I built in 91. I started building in 91. I guess I 
see, yeah, I started building in 91. I think I moved in in, I think in January 92. It took them a year to build. And you retired December 1990, is that correct? 1990, okay. yes. The, I get involved in other things other than ship groundings. How about casinos? Yeah, we tell me about it, really. The, uh, the state of Mississippi, of course, I had testified in the courts. I testified in the landmark boundary case in Mississippi. Sinky Bambini versus the state of Mississippi. The, in my previous jobs, we worked the coast. And I got to know the attorney generals and I got to know the various people in the states. And most states, not all, most states, the boundary between upland, which is subject to private ownership and sovereign, is the mean high water line in general. And most of these states didn't know where it was or what to do with it back and forth. So we saw a need for an educational program. You must understand, and of course, you get out to the main low, low water line, salient points on that. You select salient points on that. These committees back in Washington, and that determines where the state ends and the feds begin. In general, that's three miles from salient points along the low water line. Mm -hmm. The state's on out to three miles, not all of them. Texas only out to three marine leagues. Texas was a republic before she became a saint. And we said, y'all need to understand these tides and we need to train the surveyors. Surveyors are very, land surveyors are very good in what they do, but doing tidal surveys is different. Because a tidal sur the tides is a local phenomenon and cannot be extrapolated over large distances. You need another tide gauge. So we began working cooperative projects with the states. And, uh, Giant Stadium, New York, Hackensack Meadowlands. Mm -hmm. It's built in areas that was below mean high water. I've been caught up there many times in New Jersey, Hackensack Meadowlands, all over that. And uh, they want to go back to where it used to be in 1604. And I used to tell the state officials, well, you better talk to God. He's the only one that knows that back in 1604. But we can give you the latest the, the best information available, that's the earliest day chart. That's the best information available when you go on. So we started working in the states, explaining tidal datums to them because it's an interest to the federal government. First of all, charting, we have to have that line. Secondly, if you go out here and dig a oil well, is it in state waters or federal waters? Mm -hmm. uh, back in the 60s, I worked on the Louisiana Low Water Line Survey, Chaffalai Bay because wells had been drilled out there. Is it in federal waters or state waters? They didn't know. So back in the 60s, they had $6 billion in escrow trying to figure out where that is. So we entered a major program with the state and other government agencies for us to go in and establish tag gauges and determine the mean low water line because you find a lot of small islands offshore and that changes the complexity. You just keep bouncing out. Mm -hmm. So we surveyed we determined all the tidal information and got the mean low water line so the committees could draw the lines out there to decide who gets the royalty off of these oil wells. Makes a big difference. But the federal government has a, a deep interest in it. The states have a deep interest. And since both of those, neither one of them trust each other, so we enter agreements. And we are the ones that operate the tide and water level observation network. We have continuous operations in Presidio in California since the early 1800s. Are you, is, and we, who is the we? NOAA, Coast and Genetic Survey. Okay. Coast and Genetic Survey. I was still trying to figure, <laughs> yeah. figure out that what was, was contract and what that was, was. That was that part was, of our job. Okay, got it. I used to be in charge of all that program. Yep. And so we, we started working with these states on determining their boundaries. And they had a major problem. They even questioned the Submerged Lands Act of 1954 in Mississippi during a Sinky Bambini versus State of Mississippi. Working with Attorney General's office down there, we entered a cooperative program to establish tidal datums so you could lay the line on the ground and you knew where the mean high water, low water, all, all the tidal different lines would be. And I was one of the expert witnesses in the Sinky Bambini. 
boundaries. Are you saying Sinky Bambini? C-I-N-Q-U-E, Sinky Bambini. Okay. <laughs> I had in my mind like that that was some weird like no, New Jersey that's, nickname. That's a, that's of, like, a name. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, they owned a, owned a lot of land down there. Okay. And a lot of it was salt marsh. And uh, so my name got out among the lawyers on boundaries. And I've testified in boundaries all over the the United States. The Mississippi legislature passed legislation in regard to casinos. Used to, you could sail them out and get them at sea and operate out there. But finally, the legislature passed in Mississippi. They could have casinos along the three coastal counties, but they had to be in the Missis they had to be in Mississippi Sound or the bays. They couldn't be in bios or rivers, except the Mississippi River and makes it pretty clear. What's a bayou, what's a river, what's a bay, what's Mississippi Sound? And their initial said it has to be on a barge. It'll accommodate 150 people, draw at least six feet of water, something of that nature. And you can build a hotel and, and that barge's got to, where it rises and falls the tides. Everybody wants to push that, say this is a legal site, this is not. And so, the attorneys knew me, and at one time I was working for six different casinos. Now, when I started, I, first of all, I read the legislation, see what it said. It would be along the six coastal counties, the three coastal counties. And I thought, wait a minute. Mississippi Sound round number is 12 miles wide, but then you've got the Bear Islands, Horn Island, Petty Boy, and all those others straying out there, Dolphin Island. That's over in Alabama, but it's part of the same thing. But the county boundary is a seaward boundary of those islands. That's county. I said, wait a minute, you can't operate on your legislation this way because you've got to put your casino out under. It's hard for a car to drive out there. You say along the three coastal counties. You're in the coastal county, so put your casino out there. They said, hmm, we hadn't thought of that. We better change that legislation. So they amended the legislation so they could be not on the Barrier Islands, but they could be there. And it'd be a lot of litigation. I want to build one here. Well, that's man-made. You can't build it man-made. That's a, that's a bayou. So I got heavily involved in litigation there. One time I mentioned I was working for six different casinos over that. And uh, they changed the legislation. And after Hurricane Katrina, they said you can build within... 800 feet of the mean high water line. So lawyers call me and says, can you come down and tell me where to build a casino? I said, well, is your legislation clear? Yeah, we build 800 feet. I says, but your mean high water line is meanders. Which direction do I measure from? They said, what do you mean? I says, am I measuring perpendicular to that mean high water line here? Or am I coming down here and measuring 800 foot and then I draw me an arc and I'd build anywhere in that? Well, we don't know. I said, that's a problem your legislators. First of all, they're stupid people. They don't understand what they're doing. But they're, they've got a job. So we need clarification. They said, well, what do you recommend? I said, I need, think they need to look at this. And you measure. I've got a little bow up here. I measure 800 foot here, and it comes to here. And then I draw me a, an arc. And that's my irregular 800 foot pattern. I've got to build within that area. They said, that sounded good. So that's what they've adopted. So they pulled me down on boundary determination, whether it be a bio, and that gets into what's the definition of a bio, what's the definition of a slough, a river, is it a bay, where does the bay stop and the bio begin? You look at headlands, everything of that nature. And uh, I worked on one project down there that we got approved. I don't think it'll ever be built. I don't think it'll come with money. It was going to be a $4.5 billion resort. And uh, I've tried to get out of that. Matter of fact, I talk to the lawyer. He calls me quite frequently with cases coming up. And uh, the last big one I worked on was Diamond Head Corporation in uh, Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. And uh, their survey firm in Gulfport that we retain. I'm not licensed. As a matter of fact, I don't carry license anywhere. They can't get me for testifying somewhere on somebody else's license. I don't have no license. But I get a licensed surveyor. 
Mm. Most of the time, they won't do the survey unless I'm in the field with them. Because you go to court, you've got, got all of that. So I wouldn't want to guess how many cases I've worked on just casino location in the state of Mississippi. I can't even, I can't even imagine. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but oh. it's it's interesting. You get into different things. You do research to figure out what it is. Uh, I was retained by the Attorney General of the State of California. Mm -hmm. I thought it was straightforward. Then I got into it more and found out it was a lobster criminal case. Because what had happened, Santa Monica Bay is closed off for lobster fishing. That's the habitat for the mama lobsters to raise their little ones. But you know, lobster is kind of a delicacy in these restaurants around there like lobster. So what they would do is there's illegal fishermen. You put out a lobster pot, you got a buoy. You wait so many days, you go snatch your buoy, you pull up your lobster pot, get the pot lobsters out. But if I got a buoy floating in there, the marine police are going to see that. So what they did, they designed a zinc, an, an artificial zinc, or a, a sacrificial zinc. That's where the electrolysis eats on that instead of eating on your boat. Your, your outboard motor is going to have a sacrificial zinc on it. All your ships have sacrificial zincs. That's so the electrolysis eats on that sacrificial zinc instead of damaging the hull. So they had a basically a seven-day sacrificial zinc manufactured. They would go out they would pull the chain or line between the pot and the buoy and clamp it off with this sacrificial zinc. They go out and plant it. The rope's not long enough. The buoy is underwater. It's out there seven days, and they, that fisherman knows when it's going to bounce up. So he's just out in his little pleasure boat running around. All of a sudden, boop, that buoy jumps up. They get it. Big price for the lobsters. However, the Marine police caught one of them doing that, fishing lobsters in a closed area. And they picked them up on GPS. The only GPS that had been accepted in the court system of California was when Peterson killed his wife and they put a GPS ankle monitoring on him. That was the only GPS that had been used in the court system. You may remember Peterson killed his wife, dumped her at sea. And uh, so now then we've got the Marine police using GPS to arrest this. So his attorney has approached that GPS is no good. And so what I had to do when they retained me, I had to go back, it gets back to geographic names. I went back on geographic names, looked at Malibu. When was the post office there? What was the name of Malibu? Was it Santa Monica Bay? All of that. So you get all your geographic names established. And the nautical chart now is real. We got those names and that's what the, is called on all of this because they're raising question with the nautical chart. But then we get into GPS. GPS was designed and I had to get people from JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, to come in and talk about the theory. But when the government outfit that put up these GPS units, they designed the GPS constellation for 24 satellites. And they're claiming, and the, the datum for the GPS satellites is WGS-84, World Geodetic System of 1984. Mm -hmm. But the system we used on the nautical charts at that time was North American datum of 1983. And it's an Earth-centered datum. There's very minute differences between the two. For practical purposes, navigation, no problem. So they were claiming they couldn't use that GPS at sea because they were using from satellites on a different data than what the chart was. We had to get in and say, hey, out of these Coast Guard relay stations, Coast Guard receiving stations, they get the GPS satellite, they get it in there, they massage it slightly and actually bring it basically to the NAD-83, same datum, rebroadcast, that's what the ships use. But now then they get in, well, wait a minute, GPS is no good because it was designed for 24 satellites. And we had to be careful from JPL and not get too much technical in here because of if there's any classification, you can't bring that in. So they're arguing the system is no good because at that time there's 27 satellites flying. And they're quizzing me on with all of these back and forth and it's no good. And I thought, I'm not sure the judge is understanding this technical stuff, so I'm going to bring it down to something he understands. 
So I just let the lawyer talk, and I turned to the judge, Your Honor, yes, witness. I says, do you have a car? He says, sure, I have a car. I says, do you have a spare tire in the trunk? He says, sure. I says, we have three spares on the satellites in case one of them fails. We got one put in its place. I said, just like your spare tire in your car. You're not going to use that till one fails. No more on number of satellites. Those are spares. We won our case. Now GPS is accepted in all courts in oh, California. That's pretty cool. It's just little things of that nature. Well, so the fact that you like to do all this research, right, and you like to be able to make it understandable by a layperson, I think feeds into what the position you're in now. So yeah. we're, we're here at the museum, and you've... I don't want to say you were coerced, but you were invited to sort of be an interim director and then folded into a director position yes. um, because of your volunteer experience with the um, attached but separate military museum. Mm -hmm. um, maybe talk a little bit about um, what you're doing here at the museum. Maybe just briefly, because we're already almost at two and a half hours. So, um, Well, I had... Volunteered down the military museum for almost 20 years. And down there, we do everything. Uh, treasurer, secretary, president, member of the board. We design, build exhibits. It's an all-volunteer. All-volunteer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't have a big budget down there. We get what money we use, basically memberships and donations. We're doing okay. And uh, the... Sometimes the curator of the Greater Southwest would come down and want me to do certain things back and forth, and I'd listen to him. I'd be courteous, but if I disagreed with it, well, I'd do what we want to do anyway. Once our we agreed to do it, the board agreed to do it. It's run by the board, and uh, most of us that volunteer down there, ex-military, if he was given a job, you did it, and you did it the best of your ability, and you did it right. And uh, we've done it right in the military museum, and we might have made mistakes along the way, but uh, we'll put our museum against about anybody's of that nature. And so when they asked me to look at this, and of course, since we're housed in this building, I was always concerned about security. And uh, since long before I came to the greater Southwest, I was in the military, and I had decided that we needed a new camera system. And so I did my research, and I found three companies uh, that service Ardmore and got bids from those. And got the Greater Southwest because I figured, hey, it's a building. We need all of it. We need the fire, uh, intrusion alarms, dash breakage, all of that in it. And so uh, that was going to run us several thousand dollars. And uh, I figured the only way we could do that is with a grant. And so... I tried, tried to work up here, and I finally got them to agree that, hey, we need this. And we put a grant together. Instead of giving us our full amount we needed, they gave us half of it on a matching grant. And I said, well, that's $15,000 more than we had. So it was time for the military newsletter to hit the street. So I wrote an article in there, this is what I needed, safeguard our products. Since we're in here, I need all the fire alarms all tied together, compatible with all of our emergency people. We need these cameras and everything of that nature, and we got to look at the building. Within 10 days, I had more than 15,000 come in through the military. The director at that time, Greater Southwest, says, I've got to advertise. I've got to help you out. I says, yeah, you do. you got a lot more space than I got. The Greater Southwest did not raise one red penny. The military did it all, and we put it in. It's a good system. We got cameras inside, outside, up-to-date, glass breakage, intrusion, alarms, all of this other, monitored, and so. But we did that out of the military. My point is saying that, if you got something to be done, do it. So that's what we did, and everybody is reaping those rewards from that. And then when it came time, they had some problems up here. I always sat on the board as an advisory trustee. That was a good position for me to sit in because I could express my views. I couldn't vote, but I could express my views. And sometimes pretty strong, 
if I thought it was right. My daddy always said, if you think you're right, fight a bus or prove it. And a bus saw something you just cut your firewood out in the country. If and you so, think wait, wait, if you think it's right, find a buzz saw. I'll prove it. Yeah. Is that what it is? So, if you think you're right, fight a buzz saw to prove it. Oh, okay. If you think you're right, fight a buzz saw to prove it. And so, you just kind of take that attitude. And uh, the board got to re up here got to respect me, and I respected them. I didn't go off in the wild blue and say we need this, we need that. I looked out for the complex, and. That's probably the reason they asked me to step in on an interim basis. I made it quite clear to it. I don't want a job. I'm not looking for a job. I'm retired. And my wife probably won't be happy if I go to work again. And she's still not. So they continued. I started doing things when I took over. When was that? About 5.30, May the 30th, 2014. <laughs> Um, roundabout, right? <laughs> roundabout, too. And uh, so I went to changing stuff immediately. The uh, There was only one individual here that was the office manager had been here uh, since the end of March. So uh, me and her, I went around, I said, this place is dirty, it's filthy. You see all that glassware? Find a dishpan and start washing it. I took the vacuum cleaner and started moving stuff and vacuuming and cleaning and changing light bulbs. There's only 13 bulbs out out front when I took over. Uh, a couple of big plastic globes gone. I go down, I buy an order, had to order those those globes to bring it back in. First impression, you only get one. And so I started cleaning them and I started finding problems and I started fixing those problems. And I started doing it myself to save money. I'm pretty handy at carpentry work building cabinets and whatever needs to be done. I got volunteers come in. We, uh, my tractor wouldn't work. My lawnmower wouldn't work. I got volunteers to come in, weed eaters and lawnmowers, and we started cleaning the facility up. And I guess the board saw what I was doing, making improvements. It's a complex. And I not only was I making improvements outside, I was making improvements inside. I was replacing light bulbs. I was replacing ballast. And uh, I replaced a few in my life. I didn't have to call a qualified electrician. All you got to do is take a few wire nuts off and change that ballast out, put bulbs in it, and they burn. So they come, board kept coming back to me. Hey, will you consider being full-time director? No. Nope. Here another would come call me. Will you? No, no, not interested. Find somebody. So they advertised. They said, you're going to apply? I said, no. And uh, people come by would ask me, are you going to apply for the job? I said, I have no intention of applying for the job. Okay, oh, I'll apply for it if you're not going to apply for it. I said, I have no intention of applying for it. I wasn't looking for a job. They just kept riding me back and forth, back and forth. And the office manager found down in the military one of my biographical sketches. And she submitted to the board and said, he's changed his mind. Here's his biographical sketch. He says he wants the job. My God, everybody come in. You've, take, you've agreed to take a job. I said, I agree to learn darn thing. I don't want a job. So now I had 15 after me, plus the office manager. And I'd got them to agree to a major project on tools of our land. And I talked to one of our longtime volunteers. I says, the only way I'll consider it if I get full support, try to get tools of our land building until I get the thing running to ensure that the military museum is protected. And so in one of the senior moments, I says, okay, fine. But I still do consulting. I still do all this volunteer work. If I wake up some morning and I'm doing something else, I don't come to work, they say, that's fine. And so they made me made, made me permanent. I forget, I volunteered here, here, here a couple of months. I don't remember sure when it was. Uh, I never even know the difference. Uh, so I started looking and I had received complaints from people visited. Uh, a lady from Plano, Texas talked to me. She's an OSU graduate. Her husband is OSU graduate. He's Texas, both of them are A&M graduates. Mm -hmm. 
And she says, I read in the Arborite, she looks at it online, where you're the new, the new, the new director. She says, I visited that place about five years ago, and I told my husband, we're not going back. It's too dirty and dark, you can't see it. And we're not going back to such a place. I said, I'll change that. We got it cleaned up. I called her. I said, okay, get your butt up here. Here's it. We Did had she a, come? Yep. Okay. <laughs> we had a, a couple come in this morning. Her brother put in a little oil field place out there, the lamb I mentioned to you. They come to Ardmore. She wanted to come by. He's dead. She wanted to come by and see it. She was very pleased. It's been cleaned. It's lighted. And she sees where the display has been changed. Mm -hmm. And more stuff has been added. Very pleased. Her husband been here about five years ago, and he said, well, he says, y'all have done something in here. You've changed. He says, it's altogether different. It's a beautiful museum. And so we approached it, and I told the board right up front, and I told the staff. I said, I'll run a museum. I'm not running a storage facility. And uh, I took over in June. I hired Kevin in August, the 1st of August. I was advertising for a receptionist front office person. He come by with his resume and applied for it. I looked at his resume. I said, I ain't gonna hire you for that job. I said, you want to volunteer? He says, well, yeah, I've just moved back here from graduate school, I'll volunteer. I had just carried the 18 outboards out of storage on a hot July day, covered with filth, grease, what have you. But I thought those should be on display. I carried them out and set them up there, and I says, go clean those outboards. And he spent two or three days cleaning those outboards, other things, and I said, okay, start cleaning the other stuff. And so he volunteered here about a month, every day. And uh, I thought, hey, he's a pretty good worker. And I called the president and the vice president. I said, hey, come by, I want to interview him for a possible curator job. I said, what about a certain time? So they show up. He's in early, he's volunteering. I go get him, I said, hey, we're going to talk to you. <laughs> president told him, says, we want to talk to you about hiring you as a curator. He laid him out of his chair. He says, what? <laughs> they turned to me, they says, didn't you tell him you was interviewing him? I said, no. They says, why didn't you tell him? I said, he had to worry about it. Now he's nervous. We'll get some answers, we may not others. But if we had told him in advance, well, he'd have worried about it all night. I like to surprise people. Apparently. <laughs> so hired him. And uh, he's worked out very well. And the, we get, get telephone calls and visits from our neighbors. Now, we were having trouble with vandals. We had people trying to steal some air conditioners. We had people rattling doors trying to break in. We had people kicking in the doors of our residence. And I went to Ken Grace and I went to Milton Anthony, Ardmore Chief of Police and the County Sheriff. I said, Ken, I'll be right up front with you. If you don't start patrolling that more out there and get rid of these damned hoodlums, you're going to have to call the undertaker because I'm going to shoot the bastards with my shotgun. I'm not going to have them breaking into a community outfit like that. And so they started patrolling. They'd have them set out here back and forth. And there was a place open down here. They congregated. Basketball goal down here, a little city type park. Nothing but sex and drugs and I worked with the city and got them close that off and locked the gate up. Worked with the neighbor, he had an old gate we put over down here so they can't get back there. We have cleaned the place up from the vandals and the drugs and what have you. The sheriff's department and the police department has worked very well with us and the city has worked with us in cleaning it up. And they begin to realize that hey we're making major changes and in the past it didn't appear that the city was working with the museum just kind of sitting out there now we're a community endeavor uh, the Ardmore Beautification Council they've asked me to work with them I designed the first historic mural that's painted downtown and I'm working with them to design the second one already designed well designed the third one I've already designed the second one about Ardmore's history 
and I've got it up here. I've already talked to the muralist, had him down. He's given us an estimate and all of that. We just got to find an appropriate building for it to go on. I've hosted the Ardmore Beautification Council here. They've taken tours, working good with the Arden Ride on articles. Mm -hmm. We have events, they come out, they cover it. And we collectively, with the limited staff we have, and the full support of our board, we have turned it around to a highly respected museum. There was just an article in the paper, I'll, I'll give you copies of it, that said we will rival any museum in Norman, Oklahoma City, or Tulsa. I don't know the individual that wrote that article, but it appeared in the opinion column in the Arden Right. Nice. And uh, so we have turned it around. Uh, I've told them it's, we don't need someone with detailed background in hand running museums. We got a complex. And if you've got a complex and a little bit of vision, the exhibits will take care of themselves. And uh, if you've got time when we finish this, we walk around, I'll show you. I'm fairly handy at carpentry work, finish work. I built several display cases. I got another one being built in my shop at home now. I work on it at night and weekends. And uh, the uh, I provide a lot of the materials. Mm -hmm. I've built several display cases down in military. And, uh, it's a good skill to have for the museum. I've got a, when I had the World War, cut out the World War II paintings out of the barracks building, I talked to an individual. I said, yeah, I've got to get me some oak one befores. And I'll stain them with, and build me some shadow boxes to display these paintings. Next day, my wife called me. Some people just backed up to the garage out here and wanted me to open the garage door, and they've offloaded some boards. I got home. It was one before. They'd only stained them on one side, stained them varnished on one side. I called him and thanked him. I said, uh, what kind of stain you need? I need to get some more because I want both sides stained. She called me the next day. They're just back out here, and they brought some stain and some varnish sitting in the garage. Donated which was, was nice of them mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah, it is. And uh, so it works pretty good of, of that nature. Yeah. The community is beginning to know us, and yeah. there's not a club, a group that we haven't spoken to. And uh, we went out and spoke to uh, Kiwanis. Mm -hmm. Right after I took over and I told them, I've got this, I've got that, and we're doing this. We actually put the roof on the, there was five big holes in the 700 ranch house across the street, and that's uh, in the Junior Shakes. Well, not many roofers around put Junior, sh junior Shakes on. So I bought the Junior Shakes and I showed my crew how to put them on, including the office manager who had on top of the nail gun, nailing them down. But uh, we had to replace a lot of the decking to stop the holes up, but I went down to 30 pound tar paper and Junior Shakes uh, on there because you didn't have asphalt shingles back in the 1800s. <clears throat> and we have maintained all the grounds. I had to buy a brush hog because the weeds and grass was high. I had to have a brush hog. We've got to finish more behind the tractor, but I got a brush hog to cut all of that. Well, you have 25 acres here. Is that what you told me earlier? Yeah, 25.17. There you go. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, but it's uh, all combined in there. Uh, and how much longer am I going to be in the job? I want to uh, get our buildings finished and uh, lay back and go fishing. <laughs> and then really retire again. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, that makes sense for here. I had one follow-up question that I wanted to ask, mm -hmm. and you can answer this or you can not answer this, but um, you mentioned earlier that you are maybe not impressed with the direction of OSU. Did I understand that? No, it's not the direction of OSU. OSU, in my opinion, is no different than the other universities. I see. We have too many liberal professors at the universities. Mm -hmm. The And that goes for Cornell University as well. And I think they're indoc indoctrinating our young people in a way they shouldn't be indoctrinated. Is this something that you, I'm trying to think back for when you, you said this, is this sort of at your time at Cornell when you were back in the school, back yeah. in the university system? 
the, but I've got grandkids. Uh, they've graduated from Durant, East Central, OU. They've attended school at the Redlands, various places. And I see some of the results of some of my grandkids. I've got great grandkids. Uh, I see the results of some of that. And I think what our universities have done is become too liberal on everything. Do you have an example? Well, some of these universities have hired these right-wing individuals as professors that have been brought up on federal charges. I don't believe those types of individuals should be in any of our university systems. I think OSU is a far better school than a lot of other schools because basically the old land grant is still embedded in that. Uh, I think Bernd Hargis has done a wonderful job on it. And uh, the, uh, I watched him a lot before he took over as, as president up there. Mm -hmm. I think what they should be looking at, and is tenured positions. I will relate a tenured position to a lot of professors like a bureaucrat in the government. The bureaucrat says, I've been around so long you can't fire me. The tenured professor says, you can't fire me because he's tenured. I think our university should look different than that. They shouldn't express politically one view over the other. They should cover all of them because that's the education process of our universities, our grade schools, the whole thing. The and I, I believe we have moved in a direction that's not good for our country. Just due to the liberalism. The Like liberalism is in <clears throat> too liberal in hiring or liberalism is in left of mainstream? I think they're left of mainstream. And when you go to looking, one federal agency has nothing to do with the universities, but one federal agency, in my opinion, should be abolished. That is Environmental Protection Agency. I worked with those people all the time and because I had a uniform, it did them a lot of good. Back in those days, before I retired, a lot of young women were involved in getting together with EPA and pushing all of these causes. And it did them to invite the Admiral to come to our reception and what have you because they'd want me to wear a uniform. And they're pushing all of these environmental protections. We've got to do this. We've got to protect the earth. We've got to do this or the other. They'd always want me to speak. And so I spoke one evening. We had a reception. And they had the little styrofoam plates about so big you put your hors d'oeuvres on. They had the styrofoam cups you put your lemonade or whatever it was in. They had the plastic forks you eat with. And I put them in the same position I put Jacques Cousteau. I don't know where you watch the documentary Jacques Cousteau produced. You can trail Jacques Cousteau in the Calypso. The Calypso is a 136 foot wooden hull, triple plank, X mine sweeper, the Navy built in World War II. Jacques Cousteau would go out and make these wonderful movies and talk about you, the environment and all of that other. You could trail the Calypso very easily because of the trash they threw over, especially styrofoam plates, styrofoam cups that's not biodegradable, it float forever. I have seen it personally. We had to move Jacques Cousteau from my base in Norfolk because the Coast Guard kept getting on me because the Calypso was tied up to our docks and they would pump bilges and we were on the Elizabeth River and here would be that oil sheen so the, here would go, be the Coast Guard and they'd track it to my dock. They'd come in and say, Admiral, I got to sat you again because you've got 
Oh, she ain't coming to your dock. I said, you know, that's not me. That's Jacques Cousteau. That's the Calypso. They said, sir, we know that, but it's at your dock. You're liable. So Jacques Cousteau got disinvited and tying up to the docks. Now then, all of these receptions I used to go to, and one day I thought, I'm going to put all you young women in place. Most of them are young ladies. Not all. I said, y'all are having this tree hugger reception to save the world, and here you are polluting the world by, by all these styrofoam plates you have and these styrofoam cups. At least you could do, you could find something biodegradable you can use instead of polluting our environment with this because you can burn it and you still got your water stuff. You can't destroy the darn thing. They think nothing on that. What was their response? Do you remember? Well, the other's too expensive. Now let's take Al Gore, the guy that invented the internet. When you look at the carbon he puts in the atmosphere when he flies, it, flies his private jet, but he thinks nothing of that. Al Gore's in one reason, that's money solely. Now when all of these people talk about, yeah, our climate changes because the world changes. And what people don't think about is the position of the earth on its poles the wobble of the Earth's pole. If the wobble of the Earth's pole gets in one position, a certain part of the Earth is going to get more sunlight than the other side as it turns in that. So parts of the Earth will get more, parts will get less. That changes our climate, depending on where the position of the wobble of the Earth's pole is located. That will affect our heat influx to the earth. So is it, so it's less of an issue of pollution and carbon and all that kind of stuff than just a natural movement of the earth? Is that? I think it is. Now, the on tides, we have what we call a metonic cycle. And a metonic cycle is basically 235 lunations of the moon, or 235 lunations. Now, 235 lunations, what that is, is the time it takes for the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon to make a full rotation. Each one of them make a full rotation around each other. So every point has touched each other. And that's 18.6 years. Because there's an annual variation of sea level, we round it off and use 19 years as a metonic cycle. So if you, may, if you put a tide gauge in and measure the tides for that 18.6 years, you have measured the tide, the time it takes the three heavenly bodies to complete a rotation and touch every point around these three heavenly bodies. Mm -hmm. For all three of them to rotate and touch every point. That is the reference that all tides are referenced to is the long-term stations. And that's the reason we operate long-term stations and reference the others. You don't have to operate all your tide gauges as long as you operate a, a primary station and you operate it with a secondary station, you can come up with absolute values mm -hmm. with, with doing it that way. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the people are taking that in consideration. They don't fully understand it and they don't look to see our earth. Now see again over time which scientists are not taking into consideration. And I'll use Oklahoma City as an example. Some time ago, we had a few buildings up there and some concrete. Now look at the amount of concrete and gravel we've hauled in and poured. Look at the amount of brick and block we've hauled in and built these huge buildings. Look at the steel. But well, let's move it to New York City. Look how New York City has expanded over the last hundred years. More buildings, more asphalt, more pavement. We've got the water runoff problem. It don't, it don't penetrate the asphalt concrete like it does the soil. Plus we've added all of this weight. We've taken that weight from somewhere else. We've brought it in, built all of these homes, built all of these skyscrapers, all of this concrete. 
that's an unusual load that we've placed on the earth. Naturally, that is going to change to some extent. Now I'll move to Houston, Texas. When I was surveying Galveston Bay back in the 60s, over in the northeast part of Galveston Bay, you've got the Baytown Tunnel, lower Baytown, Texas, you have the Baytown Tunnel. And all of a sudden, tides started running in it. And I happened to have tide gauges operating. Houston went to looking. You've heard Houston, we got a problem. Mm -hmm. They went to looking, what's causing our problem? They were having places with the tide getting in and never been there before. So they got us involved and we went to looking to see what's happening. And they were having seven and eight foot of subsidence. And they thought, well, it's a withdrawal of oil, but no, it's the withdrawal of groundwater to, for Houston. They had to develop this elaborate monitoring mechanism to be adequately pumped. But when you go to get seven to eight foot of subsidence mm -hmm. in a city for the withdrawal of groundwater and everything's going down and things are getting wet that didn't used to get wet and now they say the tide is rising in New York, run levels from stable ground in there and see how much New York is going down. The tides could be staying very close over a long term. But what's the subsidence around those areas? the same way along the coast of Louisiana. Because they kept saying, hey, the tide is rising, it's going further inshore. No, the tide wasn't rising, what was happening? Oil. And here comes man, and he goes into that salt marsh out there that's protecting, it's full of this little flora and fauna and all these little, little creatures and this decayed material in there feeding all of this. And since you go to getting into brackish water, in other words, you don't have as much salt up here as you do out here. But now you've got oil and it's hard to drive a truck across the swamp. So what do they do? They bring in a barge and a dredge and they dig them a canal going there. So now they have destroyed all of the salt marsh in that area. They're allowing that tidal prism to go further inshore. And when that tidal prism goes further inshore, it's taking the salinity with it, killing off those little creatures that might have been feeding in all of this area. So that is coming further inshore and a lot of that is eroding. And also with some of the oil extraction possibly in the Gulf and all of these canals they dig were to drain the swamp to get rid of the mosquitoes and what have you, you're allowing that to come further in. And for years they used to run levels parallel to the coast. And they said, well, it's, the elevations aren't changing. When I took over, I told my geodesist, I said, you go down there and you run perpendicular to the coast. You run up here to hard ground and run down there. And you'll find we've got an elevation change between these two. And so they've got subsidence along the Louisiana coast, but what's brought a lot of it is man of digging in there. And when you look at New Orleans, look at the Ninth Ward out there. New Orleans was founded on a swamp, basically. But now then they put in, had a lot of mosquitoes. They dig little mosquito ditches to get rid of the mosquitoes. You buy a boat, first thing your neighbor buys a bigger one, I need a bigger ditch. They go in and dredge and now they got canals. So they've taken all that material they've dug off that canal and put on a swamp out of here. That material they're putting in continues depressing. It'll compress that and go down. But now I've got it up high a little bit. Here comes a developer going to build houses. What happened? Hurricane Katrina. Look at all those houses destroyed building in a swamp, they should know it's going to happen. And that's exactly what happened in a lot of these areas. And I, I think a lot of the professors, not all, but I think a lot of the pre professors that's got in these universities, not only Oklahoma, but everywhere, have become very liberal and only teaching our kids one side of the system when they should be covering everything because we should be an educational institution. And that's the way I see things happening of that nature. Mm -hmm. Oh, that answers my question. I was, I, I was curious. Yeah. Um, and I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, there are a million things we could still talk about. You know that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's really hard to, to <laughs> even think about where to steer this. But I think um, we've almost been talking three hours. Mm, that's yeah. <laughs> oh, do you have you have a clock? I yeah. see. Um, so I am gonna I'm gonna stop now. But I really I think it's been really interesting. 
um, especially focusing on your your career, um, ending at the U.S. hydrographer, um, it's pretty cool. <laughs> For an old country boy, yeah. I've been lucky. I've That's been good. I've been very fortunate. Um, I've been very fortunate on it. 